Welcome to something to wrestle with. Welcome to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooed it. She pooed it. What a rib. No, you have a There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you, Bruce. I love you. Double cheeseburger. Double cheese. Double mayo. Double onion, motherfucker. Dig it. Bruce Pritchard. I'm pretty excited about uh, the next thing we're going to talk about here. It's August 23rd. So 10 days after the MSG show. We're going to go down to the Mid-South Coliseum for a USWA show. And this is where we'll see our first ever Yokozuna Lex Luger match happen. It's non-title, of course. That allows Lex to pin Yoko after a body slam, clothesline, and elbow drop. But what's fascinating about this is this is the same show where Vince McMahon is playing heel for the very first time, interfering in Jerry Lawler versus Paul Neighbors. Of course, Vince is going to interfere by tripping Jerry Lawler. And I think a lot of fans I've seen online where Vince did a heel promo leading up to this show and he's in neighbor's corner, man, this is a big moment for an independent like USWA. I know it's going to become like a developmental territory for you guys, but to not only have the world champion there and what's going to be your SummerSlam main event there, but to also have Vince McMahon as like, as we've never seen him before, this is quite the coup that happens here in Memphis. That's as you had never seen him before. (laughs) I'd encountered the heel Vince McMahon for years before that. Um, yeah, I was. And that was one of the reasons that Vince even agreed to go. He wanted to see the match with Lex and Yoko. So it was a good reason for him to be there. And while he's there, fuck up Jerry Lawler's match. It's a win-win. Yeah, it is a win-win and it's a really, really cool moment. Uh, Jim Cornette. All right, well, let's talk about SummerSlam. Such a big show. Uh, I think everybody knows August 30th, 1993, Palace of Auburn Hills, right there in Michigan. Uh, What's fascinating about the presentation here is that we've got national anthems saying for both respective countries. Aaron Neville is going to sing for America. Jimmy Suzuki is going to sing for Japan. Just crazy. When you really think about what we're talking about here, Meltzer would say, uh, Luger looked like he was 230 pounds, which is a 65 pound drop in the past year and 30 pounds down just in the past few weeks. Uh, Meltzer gave it two and three quarter stars. I guess we should mention that, uh, the finish to this is not exactly what people assume it's going to be. The Okazuna is going to miss the bonsai drop. Luger is going to hit a body slam and punch Mr. Fuji. He's going to remove his elbow pad and hit Yoko with a clothesline that sends him to the floor and there's a count out finish. So Luger wins the match, but he doesn't win the title in 17 minutes and 58 seconds. Balloons are coming down, huge celebration. The Steiners and Tatanka hit the ring. They're playing a video with Luger, uh, just highlighting his bus trip. And after the video is over, Yokozuna is still knocked out and Jim Cornette still trying to revive him. And they're trying not to emphasize that Luger hadn't won the title. And instead, just pushing that Luger won two and three quarters uh, in the Observer. It is a little weird, though. It does feel like it's set up for this big crowning moment for Lex Luger. And it looks like it and it feels like it, but it's really not. Yeah, Vince um, Vince wasn't sold. He just wasn't 100% sold on Lex. There was, you know, when you originally start on this journey. I think we all kind of started it with the end result being, okay, Lex beats him and, and that's your guy. Okay, let's go. But along the way, Lex stumbled along the way and he he wasn't drawing and he wasn't really connecting with the audience the way that we thought he should connect with the audience. And Yoko was people were believing in Yoko. So Yoko wasn't the coming off the heels of WrestleMania and Hulk beating him. Hulk, Yoko wasn't this undefeated 
monster at this point. So we also had to rebuild Yoko. Um, but I think the biggest, probably the biggest thing was Vince wasn't sold on Lex. 100%. He wanted to build Lex more and see if if Lex could withstand the test of time. So his idea was, is we'll just keep going with Lex. We're going to keep pushing him. Um, and if they're going to get behind him, they'll get behind him on the chase. So that's, and that decision was made well ahead of, uh, well ahead of, you know, the show taking place. So, I mean, we knew what we were doing, but it just, um, I don't know. It, it, I never, I just didn't feel it. You know what I mean? You know how sometimes it's like you, you get there and it, it just, there was nothing there. It was kissing your sister. He won. Yay. It was a fucking count out. And I think that's the way the audience felt. I think the audience felt deflated and, and they were like, okay, they're holding him up on their, on their shoulders. He's the hero, but he didn't win the belt. It's just, uh, let me freestyle for a minute here. It feels like, you know, in the middle of this steroid controversy and Hulk Hogan's going to step away for a little bit. Well, even going back to 1990, we're trying to find the next Hulk Hogan. We try with the ultimate warrior. We realize very quickly, there's no such thing as the next Hulk Hogan, but we sort of feel like we have our hand forced. We've got to go in a different direction. So we're going to try Bret Hart. It's a business is down. Uh, understandably, I mean, it's a, a cyclical business is what everybody says whenever business is down, but for whatever reason with bread as champion business, isn't doing what it did with Hulk Hogan. So when Hulk Hogan is flirting with the idea of coming back and at the same time, we've built this monster heel. It does feel like, okay, here's an opportunity. The Hulk experiment is maybe not exactly what we wanted. That relationship is tumultuous at best. So we decide, all right, you know what? Let's just pivot back to our monster that we built. And maybe since we can't be enamored with big overjuiced muscles, now we're just enameled with monster size. So Yokozuna is our guy. We're going to get comfortable in that role. But in the back of our mind, we really want that next Hulk Hogan. And it was a failed experiment with Bret Hart at that point, perhaps. So let's bring in who could be this blonde haired, blue eyed, muscular dude, Lex Luger. And then that just doesn't really hit. So we go back to what we know. Let's just stick with the fucking monster. Is that sort of the, if you had to, if you could peek into the mind of Vince McMahon, which would probably be a scary place sometimes, do you think that's the sort of the rationale of how we got to here where it feels like we're playing hokey pokey with who our top guy and who our franchise is going to be? Yeah, we didn't know. And that was the question. It was a feeling, you know, with Vince being enamored with Lex from, long before this, you know, back in the body stars days and all that other good shit. So uh, Lex was the guy Vince really, really thought he wanted until, until he got to deal with him all the time. Then it, he started doubting it. Um, he liked Lex though. So just wasn't sure Lex had made a hell of a career on potential. You know, I've heard JJ Dillon say that a million times, but a true, true statement. So Vince was realizing all this and going, eh, we're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep it where we are and let's see what develops underneath. You know, it could, could be bread again. It could be undertaker. It, you know, it, it, it could be Lex, maybe Lex will come out of this and it could be him on the other side. So at this point, I think he was just still thinking, um, let's wait and see, keep our options open. It's just fascinating to me that, you know, this is, uh, the biggest wrestling company in the world. And we're not exactly sure where we're headed, but Meltzer has the theory. There's a very logical business reason not to change the title here. The biggest money match the company thinks it has for WrestleMania is Yokozuna versus Lex Luger, but I can't draw WrestleMania buy rate with Yokozuna as the challenger. The scenario that seems to make sense is for Luger to be denied a title shot because of the no return clause. And then being forced to win the Royal rumble to get a shot at WrestleMania, 
which he would. Whether it was a good or bad decision will be determined by the fall or, or by the fall business. I think that's an interesting theory. Can you speak to, let's go back to August of 93. Do you think that's the idea at that point of, Hey, uh, it doesn't make sense. People don't want to see Yoko chase for the title. We need a baby face to chase for the title. And maybe that could be our WrestleMania moment. Well, that's his theory. And he's, he's completely guessing there. As, as I just said, I mean, from our point of view, it was, we have, we really had three guys we could go with Lex, Brett or taker. And Vince was leery of taker at that point because he was like, God damn, I don't want to saddle him with the championship. Then, you know, then what do I do? Um, but taker was definitely in the conversation, but the conversation involved those three and taker was kind of that alternate because Vince wanted to protect that attraction, you know, not didn't want to saddle him with the championship, if you will, at the time. So it was, it was still up in the air. And this was one of those times, you know, where you're ahead and you're thinking about where you want to go. This was a time that we had options going into WrestleMania and weren't going to decide at that point. He wanted to see, let's see what we do at Survivor Series. We'll make a decision by the time we get to the Rumble. And that's what we did. Fascinating. WrestleMania 10. Let's just talk over each other the rest of the time. <laughs> March 20th, 1994, Madison Square Garden. Uh, this is one heck of an episode. Uh, Yokozuna is going to retain the belt over Lex Luger in 14 minutes and 40 seconds. It gets a half a star. And then Bret Hart would pin Yokozuna to win the world title in what Meltzer would call anticlimactic two and a quarter stars. Really an underrated WrestleMania. There's been rumors for years and years. We should briefly address them here. Uh, that Lex Luger was supposed to win the title, uh, but he told the reporter uh, the week of or the weekend of the event that he was going to win. Vince found out about it, changed it to a DQ finish. I know you're going to shit on that, so shit away. Yeah, it's not true. I mean, I, we knew before we got there, so before any, quote, reporter, I don't even know where that came from. Here's the thing. If you're being interviewed, why wouldn't you say you're going to win? Fuck yeah, I'm going to win. Um, so I don't know how much water that holds. I know guys didn't like Lex. So, you know, that was probably some shit disturbing in, in that realm, but would Lex have done that? Maybe probably, but it had, the decision had already been made. He makes his debut August 13th in Regina, Canada. He's going to defeat Joey Maggs, who most people remember was an enhancement talent. A lot of times in WCW. His pay-per-view debut happens at Survivor Series 92. He's going to pin Virgil after sitting on him. And uh, Meltzer would say, Yokozuna is going to be a moneymaker. This is exactly what it should have been. One star. The match only goes three and uh, three minutes and 34 seconds. The bonsai drop. Talk to me about that as a, a finishing maneuver. It definitely looks devastating. You can definitely see uh, that this is very believable. And it's very believable because it probably was very dangerous. Uh, tell me about the uh, bonsai drop and and what you remember about coming up with it and any hesitations or concerns you guys may have shit light as a feather, man. Yoko, Yoko could be, uh, heavier than his 400 plus pounds. And he could also be like a pillow. So depending upon which Yoko you got that day and how he, how much he liked you. So for the most part, it was a pretty easy bump, and it was just so devastating that after that bonsai drop, what else would he do? Who's getting out of that? Who's going to kick out of that? And it was simple. It was something everyone could take. Again, this was one of those everything fell into place so easily because it was so logical, and you had the right guy in the right gimmick, doing all of the right things. Well, you know that, uh, Yoko is headed for great things because soon after this survivor series match, he's working with Randy Savage on the house shows and he's actually beating Randy. Uh, any hesitation for Randy on Randy's end, uh, to put over a new big guy like this. None. Randy wanted to work with him and Randy was happy to go out 
and work with Yoko every night because Randy saw the money in it. And Randy thought, holy shit, this big bastard is, is going to be great. So Randy thought, let me go around, take that Chief J Strongbow role, if you will. Let me go around and put this son of a bitch over everywhere and really get him over so that when he's going into your town and all the live events, you're seeing him against former WWF champion, Macho Man Randy Savage, and he's beating him. Oh, yeah. Um, it got Yoko over immediately. He comes in to the Royal Rumble 1993 on January 24th in Sacramento. as number 27 in the Rumble match. He's going to eliminate Bob Backlund, Tatanka, Earthquake, Carlos Colon, Tito Santana, Owen Hart, and Randy Savage, which sounds like one hell of a Hall of Fame class. Uh, he winds up winning the Royal Rumble match, and as a result, earns a world title shot at WrestleMania 9. And this is the first time that they had that stipulation where if you win the rumble, you get a title match at WrestleMania, pretty creative finish. Savage and Yoko are the last two in the ring. Savage gets Yoko down and does the elbow drop off the top. Uh, but he goes for the pin and Yoko bench presses him off from the ground over the top rope to win the match. And even though Yoko Zuna was only in the company for a few months at this time, you gotta think, uh, they're strapping the rocket to him. Holy cow. Gets a win on pay-per-view at survivor series very quickly after his debut now throws out half the roster and wins the rumble. And he's in the main event for WrestleMania. This is uh unprecedented to be pushed this far, this hard, this fast. Is it not? Well, every time from Yokozuna's debut up and up until this point, you would hear that music. Music was very low key, calming. Yokozuna would walk out, come through the curtain, and the crowd would all stand, and you would hear a murmur across the audience, like, oh, oh my God, look at that. Oh my, he's, oh. And then when Yoko would give his finish, there would be an audible, oh. So this bastard had captured the imagination of the audience because they'd never seen someone that size, that look. Sure, we've seen Andre. You've seen big guys. This was a big bastard that could move and knew how to use his weight. So to the average fan, they're talking amongst themselves going, who the fuck can beat this guy? How, uh, uh, how are you going to get him out of the rumble? If he, if he enters the rumble, he can't go over the top rope. Who's going to, who's going to eliminate him? So it was a perfect storm. You know, this was, um, during a time that we were all looking at different things to do and we're looking at life without Hulk Hogan. And so we thought at the time for a little while that, okay, wh what are we going to do? Do we change this formula and go with a monster heel and look for a baby face to, to chase, uh, just discussing a lot of different things. And we had the perfect storm in Yokozuna because he had captured the audience's imagination and every, I mean, he was water cooler talk. So let's go with it because you can't pick it and you can't, you can't figure out how they can beat him. And if they don't beat him and he wins, who the fuck's ever going to beat him? Well, it's just fascinating to me that, you know, this guy comes in so fast and is pushed so quickly. How is he, you know, this is a guy who's been wrestling for a while at this point. How's he responding to the push? You know, some guys don't always respond well to it and aren't really prepared for it. And we've talked about that here on the show. Others. Uh, are ready for it, but perhaps everybody in the locker room isn't. How is this perceived by others, and and is Rodney ready for this? You think? Rodney took it as if it were another day at the office. As far as everyone else in the locker room, you couldn't deny him his ability. You couldn't deny his talent. And Rodney wasn't an asshole. Rodney is a great guy that everybody liked. So you were happy for the success he was having, and if. 
what they were doing with him was successful, then it's successful for everybody else involved. So it was, it was all good. And here was a guy, if he gets over and business picks up, it helps everybody along the way. So it was, it was nice. I mean, there, there was no, I can't, there really was no animosity towards him. And if there were, then he probably just would have shut him up, but, but there weren't because Rodney wasn't an asshole about it in any way, shape or form. All right, y'all listen up. Prize picks is the most fun I've had winning 25 X by money. This football season, you just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats and place your entry. Testing my skills on prize picks this football season is the most exciting way to play da- daily fantasy sports. And if you have the skills, you can turn 10 bucks into $250 with just a few taps. It really is simple to play prize picks. You can make your picks and sol- submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. They've also got quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and really just an enormous selection of players and stat types. And that is why prize picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app. This week on Prize Picks, man, you can make all sorts of different projections. Who would have thought a couple of weeks ago that Aaron Rodgers, you could je- you could choose more or less three passing touchdowns? We know how that worked out for him. But you could still be a big winner on betting on guys like Odo Beckham. Will he have more than 50 yards? Or what about Josh Allen? Will he have more than two passing touchdowns? That's it. You pick these combinations of players. You think about the different stat lines. Yeah, I think he'll have more than this. Oh, I think he'll have less than this. Bam, you're in the game. And Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. You see, each Tuesday, Prize Picks discount select player projections by up to 25%. That provides even more value to us. And great news Prize Pick now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account. Make it happen this football season. You're absolutely going to love it. I have to tell you, I was pulling for my man Tua this past weekend. I'm going to pull for him every single weekend and prize picks is going to make it fun for you to enjoy football in a whole new way. I know I am. I'm having fun. I'm making money. That's a win-win go right now to prizepickscom slash wrestle and use the code wrestle for a first deposit match of up to a hundred bucks. That's prizepickscom slash wrestle. Use our code wrestle for a first deposit match of up to a hundred bucks. Prize picks daily fantasy sports. Made easy. Uh, let's get back to the ultimate warrior though. You guys did a really great job building this up here. Uh, if you think back to kind of how this all started, uh, macho man attacks the ultimate warrior on main event. And then Sherry appears at the Royal rumble during an interview segment with the warrior and begs for a title shot for macho man. Uh, later in the night, she distracts the macho man. Uh, or she distracts the warrior and macho man sneak attacks him during his match with Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, a few minutes later, uh, back when they're, you know, back ringside, macho man really lays it in with a scepter shot on the head of the warrior, allowing Slaughter to get the pin and become the world champion. And so they start to promote this as the first time ever, uh, for a career ending match in the WWF. Do you remember a career match prior to this in the WWF, or is this just the first big time one on pay-per-view? Not that I remember. It was, it was the first, first one on big time pay-per-view. That's for sure. So who, who pitches this idea? Do you remember? Well, Randy was, you know, looking to take some time off. He had, he's fresh on a broken thumb here. I don't know if you remember that, but he had just broken his thumb. He's got two pins in there. Um, I and, don't, yeah, I, I don't recall that, but Randy was, was definitely looking for some time off and to take a break and he'd been running hard. And so when you say take a break, he just wanted to come off the road for a little bit and be a spokesman for the company. He wanted to do commentary or do you remember what the real plan was at this time? I think at the time it was to be a spokesman, but actually at the time was for him to take some time off and get away from the business for a little while and then come back and be a spokesman. And then, you know, I, I don't know that it was ever necessarily one of the things i hate about stipulations like this is i don't think that it was ever really the intention that randy was going to retire and be gone forever there was always the thought that well he'll be back yeah Meltzer. uh i know you love this but jesus he suggested that you know maybe one of the ideas would be there would be like a letter writing campaign to get macho man reinstated 
and you guys would request, you know, if you'd like for him to be reinstated, send your, you know, note to blah, 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 as a way to capture addresses for mailing addresses. So you guys could send him catalogs and stuff and market stuff. And he certainly did something like that, uh, the year before with the tugboat Hulk Hogan situation. Yeah, definitely. We did do that. Whose idea was that? Cause that's, what? that's pretty genius. Oof. I would imagine probably Vince's. I don't know. That's that's a really, really great idea. Bob Collins, Vince, I don't know. Okay, so uh, let's get into the match. Sherry and Macho Man are carried out on thrones for this. It's a pretty cool spectacle. Any memories uh, of that idea or maybe funny stories of carrying them around? Maybe mishaps or guys who went on to be something like Cena was with Punk at that one WrestleMania? Or DDP was for the Honky Tonk Man? I don't think any of the guys that carried Randy out that night went on to any kind of stardom, but it was, you know, the, the sedan, as we called it, the sedan. Yes. It was a sedan. And, um, it looked heavy. It was, it was heavy without anybody on it. Yeah. And then you had two human bodies on it and it, it got a little tricky sometimes. And those guys were always afraid for their life that they may dump randall or sherry somewhere and randall 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 baby uh warrior trunks have been a topic of debate here uh, for a long time amongst us fans the rumors and innuendo uh, on the back of his trunks that night were the world wrestling federation heavyweight title and the words means much more than this and a lot of people said that that was a way of taking a dig at him either not being in the main event or the title picture or trying to stress that his match was more important. Dig or no dig? Well, I think it's silly that anyone would even think it's a dig because you're talking about the context of the match. You're talking about someone's career versus a championship. And giving importance to that match, his career meant more than a championship. Right. So it was just simply... In the context of the match, the career and the the warrior and all that to him was much more important than a belt or a championship. That's all it meant. Uh, this is the first time we saw the Ultimate Warrior wear a duster that I remember. Uh, and commentary makes a really big deal about his knee pads having a picture of Macho Man's face on one and his on the other. Um, is this a little bit of a ripoff of Rick Rude? Rude really made this famous, having airbrushed gear custom for the match. That's what kind of this felt like to me. Would you disagree? I don't know that. The, yeah, I don't know. I mean, okay, this is fun. Uh, so Sherry was decked. Well, out. I know. I mean, you're asking. You're asking me. Was I in Jim Hellwig's head to know that he was going to get back at Rick Rude and go to an airbrush? I never said, I never said it was getting back at. I wanted to know <laughs> if the boys thought, oh, he's doing the Rude gimmick. It was kind of his gimmick at the time. Was he there? Yeah. Was he there? Fuck this. Was uh, so, he there? No, he had gone. No. So it wasn't his gimmick there anymore. So. He okay. wasn't there for anybody to compare to. And, you know, Rob Van Dam did it. So was Rob Van Dam a rip off, rip off of Rick Rude? Yes. Okay. Glad we had this talk. Um, he didn't, Rob Van Dam didn't wear his opponent's stuff and make match specific stuff. Okay. All right. Never mind. This isn't so much fun sometimes. Sherry was decked out this night. Feel and, my uh, pain. <laughs> I always thought she never got her just due. Uh, what can you, as somebody who was there, testify that Sherry really meant to the matches? Oh, Sherry was great. The boys, if you ask any of the boys who they'd rather work with, all of them would rather work with Sherry Martell. She was... Rather than... You rather, said rather than anybody. Okay. <laughs> you know, you could have a match with Sherry. She'd sell and make you sell, and it'd be believable. But Sherry was a huge integral part of the the macho king and the queen sensational queen sherry she just was great at everything she did she added to that package she reacted to every little thing and accented the match and didn't steal from it uh these guys would wrestle the next year at SummerSlam, and uh looking back at this match i still think this particular match is the best match of the Ultimate Warrior's career. Would you agree with that? Probably so. Probably the best match Warrior ever had. 
So I want to kind of talk about some of the match. Um, cool spot here. Randy does a cross body. Warrior catches him, but stands him up and then slaps him. Uh, it really added to the story that, you know, Warrior's the bigger, stronger guy. And around this time, Gorilla starts really reiterating this is the largest pay per view audience in the history of pay per view. There's no way he would have known that at that point, right? This is just a line from Vince. I'm sorry, you're asking me to tell you what line Vince gave? No. You know what that was in reference to? Was we were broadcasting that to the troops oh, I see. all over the world. So the audience was the largest audience because of the the number of troops and where we were broadcasting. We broadcasted it for, for free on the uh, armed forces radio or, yeah. or you know whatever. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We broadcasted it live all over the world, and so the audience was huge um, as far as pay per view buys. No, at that time we're, it was WrestleMania five. We're never getting away from the way you split hairs here. Just so you know. Well, no, the audience I, was the largest. I get that. It was because we were broadcasting. What we, does it sound like we're talking about right now, though? It sounds just like attendance and tickets No, it's, it's, that's what you choose to pull out of it. He said it was the largest pay-per-view audience, and you're saying, well, was well, it pay-per-view? Hang, you didn't hang, say hang, pay-per-view hang, buys. So it was the largest pay-per-view How audience. How is it pay-per-view it was, if no one's paying? Because that's what we refer to them as. So... That's how we refer to that's how we refer to the events. It's a pay per view event. Okay. So because it's a pay per view event, should have just been was, a per view. It was broad. There's no pay, so he should have just said this is, this is the largest per view audience in the history of per view. But it wasn't. Yeah, anyway. it was. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Uh, Sherry's wearing some super revealing stuff here, and I think around this time she started to really push the edge with some of her outfits, you know, thongs and stuff like this. Is it fair to say this is like the precursor for the Attitude Era? There was a series of matches here where she would be stripped down to bra and panties and stuff like that. And that was kind of pushing the edge here for WWF at the time. Do you remember that being a conscious decision? And who would have been the person who says, uh, why don't we show a little cheek here, pal? Well, a lot of that usually was Sherry <laughs> volunteering it. Um But I don't think there was necessarily a conscious effort to go, let's do bra and panties. Um, as a matter of fact, it was probably the, the other way kind of shine away from that. Right. Um, but I know Sherry always used to like to do that. And I, I never liked the, you know, the guys putting their hands on women anyway, in general, that's tough to sell. It's, yeah. it's just a tough sell. I don't care where you are and what you're doing. Heel baby face. That was always the excuse. Well, she's a heel. So it's okay to do whatever you want to, too. Whose excuse was that? That's everybody's excuse. It would be the talent's excuse to say, well, she's a heel. You can go ahead and get away with it. And because the audience popped, it's it's okay. She's a heel. It's okay. I just just never liked it, but, you know, sometimes they they did it. Warrior uh, pushes Sherry here uh, when they're on the outside. Pushes are pretty hard and pushes are down. And it's not even addressed at the time. So they're, what you're saying holds water. Well, what's, is this the first time you remember this many finishing moves being used over and over and over and not finishing? It feels a lot like now you see guys hit a move a dozen times and then they still kick out. But back in those days, it, it was, was it was unique because usually when a guy hits his finisher, that's you know, it. that was it, and you work to the finish. And these guys wanted to do something different. And, you know, career match that they wanted to make it special and just be able to, you know, go out and make it different. Uh, it's time for the pin now. And uh, after all these finishing moves, Warrior wins with just a foot on the chest for the pin. Your thoughts? Hated it. Kind of I thought it was disrespectful to, to Randy Savage, the performer. I thought it was disrespectful to Randy Savage, the man. I also believe that it was probably Randy Savage's call, knowing Randy and knowing how Randy was a firm believer of win him in the ring, lose him in the ring. You win him one, two, three, you lose him one, two, three, right in the middle. And I could see Randy basically anointing the warrior and saying, you know what? Beat me, stand over me, and be the man. Because well, Randy knew what was coming afterwards. So it was, it was simply... Um, Simply a way to get Warrior over. 
As if that's not enough, Warrior takes a victory lap around to the corners and then again comes back to the center to put a foot on the chest, uh, this time posing with the duster on. It just seems a little disrespectful to not only pin him with one foot, but to make a victory lap, uh, throw your shit on, and then do it again. Well, it is to me. And I think that the talent at the time, I am defending Warrior, I think the talent at the time, everybody knew what was going to happen next and f- felt that Randy was going to have his moment at the end. So get your moment now and then move on. And Randy gets his moment at the end. And it did work. It did. It did work. But as you and I watched it, I even told you that when we were watching it, I thought that was, it, it rubbed me wrong. I knew what was going to happen. What, um, I'm curious the thinking that goes into the what happens next. Sherry attacks the Macho Man after the match. She's upset that he's lost, seemingly, you know, because of the impact it'll have on her career. And then, of course, Liz, who they showed in the crowd uh, a good ways away from the ring, two rows back down uh, the aisle. Um, She comes to the rescue and throws Sherry out of the ring by her hair, and the crowd goes nuts for them to reunite. Women in the crowd are crying everywhere. And then they reunite, and he uh, embraces her, puts her up on the shoulder, and then when it's time for them to leave, he used to make her hold the ropes open for him, and this time he opens them real big for her. And the replay they show on the pay-per-view isn't of the match at all, but it's of him picking her up. So he started the match as a heel, worked as a heel, uh, you know, cheating and chairs and all this stuff. But then Liz come back, comes back to him, so now he's a baby face. Has this ever happened before? It's a pretty interesting dynamic that a guy can you know, start as a heel and work as a heel the entire time, but because a woman likes him, he's a baby face. Well, I mean, God, it really yeah, speaks they, to they, the power they of Liz. Were, well, it spoke to the power of the couple. Mm-hmm. It spoke to the, to the package of, of Randy and Elizabeth through the years. That was a unit that god you know i mean they were iconic um huge heels huge baby faces and liz was never really a heel no but but she managed randy as as a heel and as a package they were heels and it just was um you know come on man they they were iconic and, and everyone loved liz she said, even as a heel, they loved Liz. And it was a way to bring them back together. And, and what people don't know is how devoted Randy Savage was to the business and to the angle when he and Liz split on camera. Randy and Liz in real life were married and got a separation, a legal separation. Wow. So that if anybody you know, would say, oh, well, they're really married. No, they're not. That was Randy's dedication to his art and everything that he did. And Jesus Christ, why we got to do this shit? Um, last week we were talking about Eddie and stuff, and now, and I told you, and I, I, I apologize, folks. The visual of, of Randy and Liz and Sherry all in the ring together. Um, you know, throw Warrior in there and, and they're all gone now. Uh, was powerful. And it's even more powerful now when you sit there and you watch that and you see them and knowing how much Randy loved Liz and vice versa. That to watch that and you're talking about people crying, man. I, I cried that night. You know, when it happened, it was a work, it was a beautiful story, but it was also those two coming back together and, and, and it was a beautiful story and it was, um, was what it was, but it worked and onward and upward. What do you think made, um, Liz so special? There's never really been a character like her since. She was quiet, classy. Didn't have to say a lot, didn't say a lot. And she was a beautiful woman, but she also was like that uh, girl next door. 
So I think she was really relatable and um, easy to like. Junkyard dog, the junk food dog, JYD, grab them cake, stump. Here we go. And how about what is these people's fascination with flipping us off? Well, they don't have t- uh, Twitter, Twitter to tell us that we suck and to fuck off. Oh, okay. What? You're airing the show three days later. Fuck you. We hate you. Ah. Your guts inside, but they count. Sorry. Hey, get my, get out of there, kid. You little bastard. Sit it down. Howard's got to come over looking nice. I liked Howard's swagger, man, when he would kind of lean back, like, I'm going to announce now. Let me dig down deep into my announcer voice, and I am going to kiss the microphone. Mmm. Anchovies. So I love the, uh, just the single solo light above the ring like that. That's what I was asking about earlier. Yeah, but they got the, they got the trusses around it to add the extra light. And now Randy's not even going with the robe. Yep. Done with the robe. Just going to go with the tight ice shirt. Limping, yeah, fucking, uh-huh. limping in man. Fourth match of the night. And he would do this again. What? <coughs> 1988 to win the world title. And th- this is right here where they came up with that idea. Um, what do you think about having Savage work four times win the title? Different outfit each time. <laughs> at a base, we did it at the classic. No, nah, not giving another car away. God damn, who do you think I am, Conrad? What are you doing? What? Like you would miss one or two of them. I love that you said, please drive to Birmingham or get your car on TV. Like, you don't think I've heard the fucking Jim Cornette episode, you motherfucker. You're low key setting me up to destroy one of my cars on TV just to fuck with me. Yeah, we're not going to buy you new rolls, though, Conrad. I don't have a rolls. Why are you saying that? I don't have five stories in my house. I, I, don't, I don't have a wing. I'm trying here. to downplay it, dog. Trying to downplay it. Just saying. Trying to help a brother out here. You know, people have heard about the the mansion on the mountain. Oh my God. It's a humble home. You can see the son of a bitch for miles. When we when when I used to fly into Huntsville, I'll never forget. The captain go, and if you can look out the left side of the aircraft, you can see the Conradison over there. Uh no need to ask which one. It's the one on the mountain. Oh, my and God. those of you on the other side of the aircraft, you can probably see it too. <laughs> <laughs> if you look closely, you can see a few Conrad's Rolls Royces out there. <laughs> no, folks, that's not a waterfall. That's Conrad's Infinity Pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how much longer do I have to wait? Oh, shit. How much longer do I have to wait until I can play that video of you floating around my pool? <laughs> Which one? When when I thought no one was there? Yeah. So I come Never. home. I can, <laughs> so I come home early from a trip out of town. Bruce is at my house. He's floating around the pool and he's uh, tanning. So he sh- Bruce is weird. He shaves his whole body, including his armpits. So he's got his arms laid back and he's trying to get the all over tan sprawled out on a big float called the big daddy mattress. And he's got, he didn't bring a swim top. <laughs> so he's got his boxer shorts hiked up to where, I mean, it's just barely covering his naughty bits. And he's playing like, I don't know, the fucking Eagles or something through the house stereo system out there. And this is in the era where people are doing prank calls and they're playing John Cena's theme. So I think it would be hilarious to get to my master bathroom window, look down at the pool where I can sit, get a great shot of Bruce. From like about the fifth floor. And yes, all the way at the top. And then I, I changed the song to John Cena's theme song and then immediately start recording as you realize, hey, wait a minute, the Eagles are over. What is that noise? Wait a minute, that's John Cena's theme song. I didn't play this. I'm here alone. 
where is that music coming from? And you're disturbed looking everywhere. And then finally you realize it's me and you see me laughing in the top window and flip me off and swim to the side and dry off and get out. No, I'm pretty sure I just went right back to tanning. Well, I I've got to, I've got to post that sooner rather than later. It's hilarious. Nobody should see my naughty, almost my naughty bits. All right. We'll, we'll have Silva superimpose something over the, the crotchal area. What should we put over that? Nothing. No one needs to even like have any video near my crotchal area. I don't know what that means. I thought you well, liked things near your crotchal area. That's what they told me at Heartbreakers when I was in there. It's the not for day. public consumption. Well, you were spreading around pretty good back in the day is what they said at Heartbreakers in Houston. Well, they don't know. Seriously, I don't think you know, but I was over there, 3200 Gulf Freeway in, in Dickinson, Texas. That's what they were talking about. Dickinson. <laughs> is that Meltzer in his shirt now in the white in the back back there? No. I oh, know he's next to a girl. No. There's no way this crowd, all right, that little kid who jumped up, he's probably still alive. The rest of these folks are dead. Why? Because they live in Chicago? Yeah, they've been shot by now. Like that, that Mima on the front row, she's dead. That's somebody's Mima. Yeah, we all were throwing Mima's over the top rope. Well, yeah. So don't act like I did some some crimes against Mima's. Well, you're killing me, Ma's in Chicago. I've never shot a me, Ma. So, baby. Mm. See, JYD has a dog on his trunks, man. The British Bulldogs had a buffalo. This was in an era. Goddamn, Elizabeth sure is talking a lot out there, man. That didn't last long. Man, wrestling in 1985 kind of sucked. Well, it didn't suck nearly as bad as wrestling in WCW for Halloween Havoc. In what year? 1998? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, think about that one. So, 13 years later, it sucked worse than it did in 1985. At least here you got Macho Man in his prime and JYD in white trunks and boots. Yeah, grab him, kick the dog. <clears throat> Who wins this son of a bitch? Took your dog, bro. So he does he win the Rolls Royce? No, they gave it away to a fan. That poor fan. What? Well, they probably had to pay taxes on it and shit. Well, I'm sure they did. Yeah, how much did that be, Conrad? Well, I don't know what the value of the car was in 1985. Okay. God, those chains look terrible, don't they? Serious business. What do you think? Uh, what do you think your boy Jim Barnett paid for that Rolls Royce? God, back in the day, uh, no shit. I heard it was like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars. It was an old one, even then. Yeah, I think they were. They're all from the sixties. I think. I mean, that's what I, I thought I saw. Yeah. It may have been. I mean, it, it was it was an old one. I mean, it's still Rolls Royce and or something. I mean, not like the 2017. You know, those that you just got. <laughs> what? It's like Rob Taylor. You got one for each year of 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 that we've been doing the podcast. That's what I heard. So my source told me. So I got a 16, a 17, uh, an 18, 17. and a 19. <laughs> yes. That's it. You know me. That's it. I know. That's why I, I know it to be true. Yeah, dude. They made these uh, Silver Cloud 3s from 63 to 66. There were 2,044 of them made. So how much How much do you think that uh, you would pay for one? In, I, I think he had it since the 70s. Man, I mean, that's cool. How much? How much do you think they went for originally? Do you know? I don't know. I mean, in nineteen seventy, a an expensive car would be a thousand dollars. 
I think the original price was probably. Okay. All right. I think I found something. I think they were probably around 16 or $17,000. Okay. And so then by the seventies, that price would go up, correct? Probably down. Okay. Well, so I, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 20, 10, like I'm going to say 10 to 12 and he probably sold it to Vince for 25 because he thought Vince and maybe Vince had a soft spot for him. And you know, the, the rumor and innuendo is that Barnett occasionally lived beyond his means. Was that his last Rolls Royce or did he have others like, like me, as you say, I think he had others. Ledger's years, much, much like you. Similarities don't end there. Uh, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> I said the similarities between you and Jim Barnett don't end with your uh, aficionado of Rolls Royces and stuff. All right. Well, what else do we have in common? Allegedly. You, uh, you both love fine clothes. You both love fine shoes. You like wrestling. Tommy rich. I don't like Tommy rich worth a goddamn. Oh, I thought you and Tommy were tight. Not at all. Oh, hell baby. God damn. Somebody say something about fire up. I had Tommy as a guest on one of our live shows with uh, Tony Schiavone and I asked him if he dipped his balls in peroxide and he wouldn't talk to me anymore. Do he answer you? No, he wouldn't talk to me. Why not? I don't know. Did someone tell you that he dipped his balls in peroxide? Yes. Oh, okay. They also told me he broke Missy Hyatt in. He wouldn't answer that either. Well, that's just great. Look, Dave Hebner is refereeing his ass off here. Is he, is he trying to gear up for a job and well, I guess he's going to stay here. It was Earl that came over from Crockett, huh? Right. What's the last for time years. you saw Earl? Um, it's been a couple of years. I saw Earl this past weekend. He was in uh, Baltimore. <coughs> and he, well, re- he, re- he refereed a match at the pay-per-view, by the way. I know you don't watch, but in the match, uh, that Earl was refereeing one of the guys, put the other guy in a sharpshooter. And by the way, that was on the ninth, the exact anniversary of the Montreal screw job. And did Earl know what to do? Nope. He did not ring the bell like he should have. Oh, hell. That would have been great though. You you don't talk about annoying everyone online. If they would have did that angle, <laughs> they would have been mad. Uh, oh, I'm stuck in the rope. Somebody help my brother spot. out. I need a snake to bite him right now. It took a lot to get that damn snake to bite him. Why do I love that spot so much? Hey, you know what I'm noticing? These robes don't look like regular traditional robes. Yeah, I, they may be cable. Wow. When was the last time we saw that in the WWF? Holy shit. I just now noticed that myself. The bottom one looks like a rope. Those top two though, though, when he was tied up, I'm like, wait a minute. This is wild, dude. This is like looking at a time capsule. And the the ring skirt with just the light blue ring skirt around there. Yeah, and all the production values just going. Yeah, and no mats around the ring. Nothing. Bill Watts said that was for pussies. And Lord knows we cared what he was thinking in '85. Oh, and there was a count out. And they didn't even shoot the referee counting them out. <clears throat> but there you go. There's your winner. My count out. Unbelievably the junkyard dog who only had to wrestle three times because the macho man didn't get a buy like JYD did. Here he is your winner of the wrestling classic. That was a classic by God. What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. I'm going to give it a solid thumbs in the middle. I I would agree. 14,000 fans here on hand. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. <clears throat> the look, I, you know, they were into it, but it, it was nothing like the Chicago crowds of today, and of of what they became because Chicago became that Madison Square Garden for a lot of the boys because of the the 
reaction of the audience and, and God damn, they're just so passionate. And, um, it was one of the best places to work because Chicago crowd was great. Well, I tell you something, mean Gene. I'm over here and I had to wrestle three times. I don't know if I'm getting three payoffs or not. And why is Jesse in the ring? Because he ain't going to work. In 1985, Jesse was already out. By the way, I feel like we should mention 14,000 fi- uh, 14, fans on hand here. The pay-per-view buy rate is a 2.53, which is relative, obviously, to the amount of households that even have pay-per-view because it's very much in its infancy. But once again, a WWF pay-per-view, innovative, pretty cool. Well, it was definitely the biggest pay-per-view that year. WrestleMania, yeah. I guess, was more closed circuit. Yes. And they, by... Uh... In this was the end of eighty six, right? This is eighty five. So eighty five, I mean. So eighty six would have been uh, the first time I think the WrestleMania was available on pay per view. I could be wrong with that. I know WrestleMania three was a little bit more widely available, but yeah, this was this was the future, right here, folks. This is what it all looked like. For the very first one, very first pay-per-view. Two big shows on quote unquote pay-per-view in 85, of course, WrestleMania, March 31st, tons of folks saw it on closed circuit. I mean, tons. And then the wrestling classic here on November 7th, of course, your two biggest markets, New York, New York, and uh, Rosemont, Illinois, AKA Chicago. Uh, WrestleMania two would be the only big show like that in 1986. But as we know, they ran that in three locations. I never tried that again. Uniondale, New York, back here at Rosemont, and then Los Angeles, California. But November 3, we would create Survivor Series. So we would have WrestleMania 3 and Survivor Series, and then we would add to it in 88 with SummerSlam. And then in 89, we would add to it again with the Royal Rumble. And this time, we would include a little No Holds Barred special. So pay per view in its infancy was taken off. And how about uh, all, all, uh, Vince McMahon, Lord Alfred Hayes, and Susan. And then we see okay. the, the recap video here. And let's let's check out the credits here and see how many names you recognize. Nelson Swagler. He's around with MLW now, right? I don't think he's there anymore. Kerwin Silfie's still around. George Scott was Ooh. the head booker. Kevin Dunn, now the executive producer. Bob Dean. His wife was uh, makeup, and Bob just got the guys, the, the crew. Gorilla Gene, Jesse Alfred. Uh, Doug Holmes, the TD. Holy shit, we were talking about Doug the other day. He's the switcher um, in the truck. Don't know any of these other folks. Electronic graphics. Don't know Betsy. Don't know Mike Farnham. Farnham. Uh, let's see how many cameramen I knew. Tim Walbert. That's about it. Holy shit. Out of the whole thing, Kerwin and Kevin are the only ones left. Going down the list for Rosemont Horizon, Harry Pappas. I knew Harry Pappas. And for Titan Sports, Ed Colon, Arena Coordinator, Basil DeVito, Howard Finkel, Administrative Assistant. Holy shit. Steve Taylor, Director of Photography. <clears throat> and Video One in Baltimore, home of StarCast. It was the first <laughs> annual wrestling classic and the only wrestling classic. Wrestle Vision in the World Wrestling Federation. I think Wrestle Vision, I guess that was what they thought was going to be the future. This brought to you by Wrestle Vision. Yeah, you assume that's like Vince's idea for what the infancy of pay per view would be or the infancy of the WWE network, whatever. Stop sending money to big insurance companies that profit off of not paying your bills. Did you know that 48 million claims on Obamacare last year were denied? That's one fifth of claims that are going to get rejected. Do you want to take that chance? Health insurance sucks. It's confusing, expensive, and frustrating, but there is a better way. Welcome to the alternative. Crowd health was created to get rid of the headaches of health insurance for 175 bucks for an individual, or just 575 for a family of four or more. You'll get access to a community of people who are willing to help out in the event of an emergency. 
You'll also get telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions, and more. All of this without doctors' networks getting in the way. Let Crowd Health help with your healthcare needs. You can get started today for just $99 per month for the first three months when you use the code WRESTLE to get the healthcare you deserve. Crowd Health is not insurance. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code WRESTLE to get started for just $99 per month for the first three months. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the promo code WRESTLE. Uh, Macho Man Randy Savage is still with the WWF, but Hulk Hogan is gone by this point. And there is a new program in town called WWF Radio or Radio WWF, where good old JR is hosting the show. And we've talked about this before. I believe it was on our WrestleMania 9 episode. Uh, maybe it was the Macho Man episode. I don't know. All the episodes are available at something to wrestle.com. Um, the co host for this radio show on this particular day with JR is Johnny Polo, who's going to go on to be the future Raven. Uh, both of those guys have podcasts today. You should check out the Raven effect. And of course the Jim Ross report, but he's doing a, um, an interview here with Randy Savage and Randy gets all over Hulk Hogan. Uh, and Meltzer says this isn't a work. Quote, the most intriguing aspect of all this is that Hogan was asked a few days earlier to appear on the show, although never informed that Savage would be on or what subject matter was being planned for the show. Apparently there was a well laid out plan to ambush an unknowing Hogan with Savage's comments in a public forum. Hogan, who had done the same radio show two weeks prior, apparently had a premonition. Something was up since it was awfully quick to be asked back on to do a radio show for a company he was no longer working for or simply was busy and lucked into not being in a potentially embarrassing position. It should be noted. It was pretty obvious the way Savage, Jim Ross, and Johnny Polo were interacting during the segment that all three knew what was about to be said. Ross, before bringing Savage on as a guest noted that he would be saying things that you won't believe and later made comments that some of the things he would be saying, you will be reading about tomorrow morning in the sports pages of your newspaper. Although at press time, no newspaper had acknowledged the interview. Although I suspect the comments to make the wrestling columns and the few newspapers that have them. It's clear from the television promotion of the show that Ross is working very hard to garner publicity for his radio vehicle. And a few weeks back, Ross was able to get the green light from Vince McMahon to be more controversial on the show and talk about other promotions. So before we talk about what Jr. and Randy Savage actually talked about, chat me up about why this was a big deal to Jr. what opportunity Vince thought it represented and why McMahon who normally never acknowledged anybody that's always been his MO when you're number one, you don't acknowledge number two iPhone doesn't talk about Android chat me up here. Why did Vince okay this? And what was the value proposition for Vince McMahon's WWF to have this WWF radio show? There's more exposure, and Vince was looking to try and create something with through another medium. And the radio show was produced by a guy by the name of Brad Saul, who had the radio network that we were on. Brad Saul was the one who founded the uh, God Podcast.com or some Web Talk Radio, Web Talk Radio, which is where I had my very first podcast. Really nice guy that ran out of Chicago and Vince wanted a, he wanted a radio show. He wanted something else. And also Jim Ross had come from Atlanta with his radio show. It was something more for Jim to do. Let him do radio, let him get out. Let's have a talk show and be controversial. Let us be the ones to break the stories and break the news versus the people that didn't work within the business. And were just reporting the gossip and rumor. So let's talk about it. Um, it's well known within wrestling that what Savage said on the show, echo things he's been saying in the dressing room, dating back to the period shortly after his divorce in the summer of 1992, Hogan was very protective of McMahon whenever the subject came up in his publicity tour for Mr. Nanny. However, in an item in the New York daily news gossip section last week, it said that Hogan would be meeting shortly with Ted Turner about starting up a new wrestling company. And it is believed the item wasn't planted by Hogan's side. 
Hogan did turn down an invitation to appear on WCW to plug his movie. Uh, and here's the comments from Savage. Have you heard the name Hulk Hogan, the five time World Wrestling Federation champion? Hulk Hogan became at one time the biggest superstar in the history of professional wrestling. I personally used to look up to Hulk Hogan, but that was a big mistake. I really thought he was a friend, but he's definitely not. He's the worst prima donna I've ever met in my life. Hulk Hogan's ego went so far out of control that Hulk Hogan consumed Terry Bollea, which is his real name. Let's just say I've lost a lot of respect for Hulk Hogan, AKA Terry Bollea, both as a man and as a human being. That's an extreme understatement that I'm saying right there. A lot of people out there might be thinking it's professional jealousy, but putting professional jealousy aside, if there is any, which I'm not saying there is, I lost respect for Hulk Hogan big time. Number one, when he completely lied on Arsenio Hall, denying the use of anabolic steroids, except for the rehabilitation of an injury. And then JR asks the question, Savage, have you used steroids? And he acknowledges, yes, I have. I used anabolic steroids. And when I was on Arsenio Hall, I told the people I did, but they were legal. It's like putting poison in your body. And Savage is asked if he uses them now. No, I sure don't. Nobody does in the WWF, but at the same time I was asked about it. I told the truth. It was prevalent at the time, not just in wrestling, but in all sports, baseball, basketball, football, you name it. It was there. It was in the gyms and it was legal at the time. Before we keep rolling here, you guys have to talk with Vince about discussing steroids in public like this, especially given everything that's going on, right? the subject was out there and everybody else was talking about it. That was part of Vince's strategy was rather than have everyone else talk about it, we'll talk about it and we'll get our story out and be honest about it. The probably one of the biggest things apparently that did hit the company was the Arsenio Hall show. And I think everybody goes back to that of when Hulk said he didn't use steroids on Arsenio Hall, that backlash hurt and stung for a while. There were a lot of people that were upset over that, particularly Randy Savage. I wasn't in the company at the time when that happened, so I don't know firsthand what that general feeling was at the time. However, I remember the after effects and, and Vince talking about we're still reeling from those comments. Um, he wanted to get his story out there that we were going to do with the WWF radio. So Savage acknowledges that he knew Hogan was going to lie on the show and he encouraged him not to, and to just be honest and, you know, told him the world was more forgiving quote. He went on Arsenio hall and lied. He lied big time. He hurt himself. I'm not worried about him hurting himself though, but he hurt all of the world wrestling federation because like I said before, he was a leader. He was a big time, five time world wrestling federation champion. So when he talks, people listen. Fair to say, I mean, you're sitting there saying that Vince has said that, man, we're still reeling from those comments. It was a leader and it did. It absolutely reflected back on us. And I, I had been told Vince, everyone encouraged him just go out and tell the truth. And because when he did take them, it was legal and it was being prescribed by a doctor for him. So Again, all of those different things that people forget about, um, it just was, it was not a good choice in my opinion and it hurt the company. I think it hurt Hulk for a while and we were still getting through it, but Vince wanted to get his side out there and wanted to have a, a true voice versus going through a third party, like a reporter or another talk show like that. Let me ask you this. Realistically, we've never talked about this before, but. Had he not said what he said on Arsenio, what would have been different? I think that it would have blown over a whole lot faster because at that point you take the gun out of their hand. When you say, yes, I did it. Um, it was legal. Uh, here's why I did it. I don't do it anymore. Um, but yeah, I sure did. And it probably contributed to, to my size and it probably helped me in a lot of ways. Great recoup powers, all that other stuff. But yes, I did it. Now people can't go back and say, he took steroid. Well, yeah, he did. He already admitted it. But now when you say, no, I didn't take steroids, you lied. All right. So people go back and now they have that. 
to say, no, nope, he's a liar. Fuck him. No, nope, he lied. And everything else, it, it, it kills the credibility go, going forward with everything else. And I believe the audience would have forgiven him and would have ra- actually would have rallied around him because he was Hulk Hogan. I think he had that power. Let's talk about the, uh, the pretty famous, one of the more famous angles that happened down there, the classic blinding angle with JYD. Let's contextualize who JYD was to Bill Watts and just in that era and in this territory, and then catch everybody up on this famous blinding angle that people still, at least one person still talks about. How many times you fucking sell out Superdome? I've been asked that at least a hundred times. Bitch. Yeah. It was, it was classic, man. Here you had the fabulous Freebirds, Michael Hayes, buddy, Jack Roberts, and goddamn Terry, bam, bam, Gordy. And it was just a hell of a, they, they were red hot. They were everything that the people in Louisiana, Oklahoma, hardworking country folk, looking at the slick rock and roll fellers in, in the free birds. It was hot, man. This was before that the time that I was working with them, good Lord, everybody knew about it. And it was just such a great angle with the hair vanishing cream and the, putting the cream in JYD's eyes and he's blind. And it's so simple. It's so simple. In a lot of ways, we did the arrogance thing with Jake the Snake Roberts many years later. It was based on this same principle of taking your top baby face and blinding them. And, and the whole thing is JYD may never see again. And the dog collar match in the Superdome, that was the, the moment that everyone knew, all right, man, Michael Hayes is going to be chained to JYD. J- JYD may not be able to see, but he can feel and Michael can't run. Mm. And that's the psychology behind it. And they got exactly what they were looking for. You had JYD who couldn't see a damn thing and use that all the way through it to get to the point of your climax of JYD finally getting his revenge, beating the living shit out of Michael Hayes. You ain't never sold out Superdome. I have not. Hey, hey. Hey, Conrad. Yes, sir. You ever sold out Superdome? Not yet. Fuck you. Hey, so that angle really put the Freebirds on the map nationally, did it not? I think it did. I think it put them on the map from the standpoint of being attractions. Yes. They're, you know, God, they were young. Yeah, absolutely. Kids. They They were just so young. And... Bill took a chance with him, and I don't know that a lot of people would have put up with Michael and his shenanigans. But Michael drew money. I make money for this company. Fuck Dave. So I wonder if Michael said dude back then. You know, I bet he did. The show drew twenty eight thousand people to the Superdome. They had one hundred and eighty three thousand dollars at the gate. And then uh, it's August 2nd, 1980. Let's do the quick rundown here. It's Andre versus Hogan, DiBiase versus Wrestling 2, Dusty and Buck Robley against the Freebirds, which is Buddy Roberts and Terry Gordy in a double bull rope match. And then of course, Michael Hayes and Junkyard Dog in a steel cage dog collar match. Were you at this show? No. I didn't think I was born yet. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. Were you born yet in 1980? No, I can't. I came out. I made my album debut. My album dropped about 10 months later. Yeah, no, I was, I was definitely not at this show. I was finishing up high school. Chat me up about JYD in this era. Other people, some people have said he was the, the Hulk Hogan of mid South. Yes, Absolutely. JYD was probably bigger than Hulk Hogan in the Mid-South region. The the son of a bitch came in, and Tom's first squash match 
on television was against the junkyard dog. And he went in and basically dog just did the big thump and then threw him in a, a wheelbarrow and took him out, take him out to the junkyard. <laughs> I can't do JYD. We would take his opponents and throw him in a wheelbarrow and then take him out to the junkyard because he was the junkyard dog. He was a heel. And then as time went on and turned a baby face and then brought these damn free birds in. The dog was a man of the audience. He, he was a man of the people. By God, black, black red, brown, green, yellow. Uh, dog, everyone loved dog. He was an extremely unique, just, he was, he was one of a kind. And in that area, dog was beloved. You did not be smirched the good goddamn name of the junkyard dog. And, the, and he was a badass to boot. And the Superdome is obviously a major venue. Would that be like Bill Watts MSG? Or what's an, what's a, a comparison for the Superdome relative to the WWF for some of oh, our, that would be WrestleMania. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me now, about, I want to ask you though, yeah. so this is one thing I love to bring up to Michael and, and you, uh, -oh. 28,000 people in the Superdome. It's not sold out. It's not even close. Yeah. Sold out. Dude, dude, dude. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Now. But I don't want that to get lost on anybody. 28,000 is a lot 28, of motherfuckers. 28,000 people. A lot of motherfuckers. A lot of motherfuckers, especially when you're running uh, arenas that, you know, hold six to, you know, 10,000 max on a weekly basis. And then you go on one arena and do 28,000. Nothing to sneeze at. I agree. But I do get a chuckle out of, oh, we sold it out. I was okay. You sold 28,000 tickets, which is extremely impressive. But. So but out, no, the SRO signs did not go out early on this one, Connie. No, they still could have bought another seat. Yes. Yeah. He could have brought an extra friend. No big deal. Right. Let's talk about somebody else who didn't really draw as well as maybe we would have thought. Well, he was over in Florida as we've well established here on the program, but he drew the worst house for a Superdome show in November of 83, just 8,000 people there. What didn't click about Butch and JYD together? Man, I don't know. Because Butch was over in Florida. Well, everybody knows that. Yeah. And, and this was in the time that he was dabbling in Apple computers and all and, and trying to put that all together. But Butch was... I don't want to buy. Just say it. I think, I think Butch was too refined. Butch was. It needed to be like, more of a brawler, more of a street fight. He needed to be more real. Okay. Butch, Butch dressed very well. And as I say that, I was like, well, shit, JYD dressed really well. But Butch just. Didn't connect with the audience. And you would have thought he would, because he was a stud and a half. He needed more yin and yang, you're saying, yes. maybe? Yeah. For, for, for it to work with JYD. Like, he couldn't be more of the same. It had to be different. Yeah. Let's talk about Stagger Lee. Explain who Stagger Lee was and why he was so important to uh, Mid-South. Is it me or is it Stagger Lee? Oh, Stagger was I just had his picture in here. Where the hell was it? JYD lost a match in which he would have to leave Mid South Wrestling. And in the middle of all that this gentleman came out by the name of Stagger Lee, who was gonna avenge what they did to his good friend, the junkyard dog. So it was Stagger Lee and people thought that Stagger Lee was JYD. Why would they think that? Same body type and, and kind of looked the same a little bit, but 
I saw Stagger Lee do a public workout and JYD was there. Oh, well then that, that kills. That's the end of that. Naked mind yoga plus Pilates is a brand new fitness and wellness studio owned and founded by Brandy Rhodes. The physical studio in Roswell, Georgia offers yoga and Pilates reformer classes plus childcare for clients all under one roof. That is truly unique. And it makes Naked Mind the only yoga or Pilates studio of its kind in the entire Atlanta area. For those of you who aren't local to the Atlanta area, Naked Mind has an app. So you can get moving with yoga and Matt Pilates classes led by Brandy and a hand-picked group of established yoga and Pilates instructors. It's a fantastic way to try yoga and get into a new fitness and wellness program. Yoga is good for the mind and the body making it one of the leading wellness practices in the world today. You can find the Naked Mind app on Apple and Android devices and enjoy $10 off your first month or retail when you use the code CONRAD10. Naked Mind plus Pilates online at NakedMindStudio.com. That's NakedMindStudio.com. What was Michael doing besides just commentary with Vince at the time? Because that's really good insight here in the late 90s doing commentary he was doing commentary then he did the live event centers and he he had his hands in a lot of different things did he produce he, though he no he wasn't producing wrestling matches at, by any stretch of the imagination no one had the confidence in him at that point but he was really really good the the other thing was was michael was that guy that you would have a production meeting and you would lay everything out and I dreaded it when I would say, uh, questions, comments, anybody? And if Michael was sitting in the back left-hand corner of the room, I would look to the front right. Like, okay, no, nobody's got any questions. And, oh, 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 I got a question. Hey, I got Constantly, he, he still does to this day. The thing about it is, is that his questions were very logical very well thought out and it, it made you sometimes feel real stupid because you missed it. But Michael would pick up on little nuances that would change things and, and make them mean a lot more. And that to me is the genius of Michael Hayes, being able to take the larger picture and making these fine details mean that much more. And, and that's what he did. So that eventually got noticed. Well, it did get noticed. And um, I mean, we know what his legacy has gone on to be. I'm sure we'll talk about it a little more. But I do want to talk about all of a sudden in 1999, he pops up wrestling again in Memphis for Power Pro Wrestling. Meltzer would write, the Michael Hayes of 1984 would have been a superstar in the industry today. The Michael Hayes of 1999 is like a parody of a wrestler. It's this middle-aged, beer-bellied second baseman still wearing a tank top on a softball team who probably was a stud in his youth, if you get the picture. It was made worse when they showed a Hayes interview today in the Bad Street video from 84, and it's like seeing the father of a rocker trying to play a rocker. So Meltzer shitting on him, but why in the world did he try his hand again in wrestling in 99? I think he just wanted to get in the ring and take some bumps and have some fun. That's, that's really all it boils down to. Well, he did. Uh, he even became the Power Pro Wrestling Heavyweight Champion in March of 99 and dropped it in May to J.R. Smooth, who's going to go on to become Rikishi. And later that month, he started managing the Hardys on TV. And that's probably the first time that a lot of fans who are listening to our show really were introduced to Michael Hayes. How did that pairing come to be? We had the Hardy Boys and go back to the camps that we used to have all the time, the Funkin' Dojos and the Hardy Boys had been enhancement talent for us for so long, you kind of started to take them for granted. But they had been through that. They'd done that for several years. And now you look at new talent. Where are you going to find them? And, and we're looking at some of these younger guys. And Cornette is the one who said, God damn, what about the Hardys? We should bring them in. And we did. And we kept them off TV for a while, long enough so people would forget about all the times they'd had their ass whooped on TV. And we brought the Hardys in as a team, but neither one of them could talk. Jeff was, was terrified, and, and Matt thought he could talk, but really couldn't. They needed a mouthpiece. 
So the idea was Michael Hayes. And Michael not only – Michael liked the Hardy Boys, felt that they had a lot of upside. So Michael was going to be that mentor to be able to go out, cut the promos for the Hardy Boys, but also be at ringside to get them through their matches, to be right there to not only tell them what to do, but sometimes show them exactly what to do and be in the heat of the moment and be able to call it for them. So Michael was there to, to get the Hardy Boys out of being that enhancement tag team and make them, if they were ever going to be big-time players, this was their chance to get out of that, out of that groove. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if, it's a matter of how much. Savewithconrad.com. It's been said over the years, of course, that Michael Hayes was not only a big fan of the Hardy Boys, but Edge and Christian as well. And, of course, that group of guys had some absolutely legendary matches, and you've sort of talked about that in fun tones before, those tables, ladders, and chairs matches. What was the relationship like with those tag teams, and, and why was Michael so in love with them? Because I think Michael saw him and Terry in both of those tag teams, being young, having their entire careers ahead of them, and being able to travel the world and learn and, and be able to experience all of these things. And I, I think I've told the, the story about the Hardy Boys sitting in the diner with Michael and Michael having the idea of what was next for the Hardys. I got an idea. How about we get these dusters, all of us, in at full length all the way to the ground, we take forks and knives and spoons, and we put them on the jackets. Ain't nobody else going to have that. Ain't nobody else going to have that. That was his great idea for the Hardys, which actually would have been pretty cool because nobody else would have had it. Motherfucker, if somebody shows up on Raw or SmackDown with utensils on it, I'm blaming <laughs> you and Hayes. All right, so let's keep it going. Let's talk about um, Fully Loaded 1999, I believe. Um, July 25th in Buffalo, New York. We've got Farouk and Bradshaw. They're the Acolytes. And they're going to win the tag titles, beating Matt and Jeff and Michael Hayes. It's 2 on 3 here. And the match gets started, and JBL clotheslines the shit out of Michael Hayes. And the finish is a double power bomb on Michael Hayes. So Michael Hayes actually gets pinned and costs the Hardys their tag titles. What do you remember about this match? Do, do, do. It was, it was time for Michael. Uh, he had done all he could do with the Hardys, and it was actually kind of the original intent, I think, that we had served that master. And Michael also being in the production meetings was – you saw what he did for the Hardys. He had good ideas for other people. So Vince started to listen to him more and, start, and gave him more opportunities to be a part. Not to, if he can do that for the Hardys and these guys, what can he do for other talent? And so Michael was brought into that creative process and used to help You know, before we get to TV. The August 9th Raw, we would see um, Gangrel beat Christian with the implant DDT after blowing mist in his eyes, and then the Hardy Boys would come out during the match and jump Christian. Edge makes the save, but Gangrel DDTs him, and then Michael Hayes runs in to pull the Hardy Boys off, but they turn on him, and you could have heard a pin drop when they turned on Hayes, and they each gave Hayes a twist of fate, and that's it. No more Hayes, no more Hardy Boys. Was Michael disappointed he wasn't going to be on TV anymore? I think Michael felt, well, I should have a comeback. <laughs> what the fuck? How bad if I went out and brought the Road Warriors in? Or, yeah, something. I think Michael really felt that he should have had a comeback of some sort in there. But um, he was moving on. He was moving on to do what I think is, I'm not taking anything away from his in-ring career because he had a great one. Sure. A uh, phenomenal one. But I think that his forte was behind the scenes. Well, he goes back to backstage work and doing color commentary again, and 
Uh, he starts doing that on September 23rd, 1999 on SmackDown. And he does some color commentary work on Sunday Night Heat alongside Michael Cole and Kevin Kelly from 2000 to 2001. He used on a lot of international broadcasts. We just covered our WrestleMania 17 episode. He got a huge pop in the gimmick Battle Royal. How excited was he to dust off that old robe and strut ass down there in Texas again? I think it was vindication for Michael to, to come out. <laughs> Do it in Texas, Houston, where it's WrestleMania. Is, it's WrestleMania. And free birds coming out. Do, do, do. But the place exploded for him. Sure, they, they were happy to see him, and he was happy to be out there. So it was a lot of fun for a free bird. First time to be in a WrestleMania. What, what does he do sort of backstage at that point? You know, 01, 02, 03. Michael was, Michael was an agent, he was, but he was also a part of the writing team. So he was part of creative and creating a lot of that stuff. Tell me what, not now, but what did it look like back in, you know, 02, 03, the writing process, the teams, if you will? Well, they, they would get together and they would come up with TV and then they would pitch Vince. And I want to get real granular here for a minute. Like they get together in Stanford. There's a room yeah. at, in the headquarters. Yeah, and actually, I wasn't even I wasn't a part of it at that time. I was still in talent relations. So but you knew how it happened. It, it just was, it was those guys getting together, and they they had offices and they had a writing room. I think at um, the studio. So those guys would all get together. Then they would pitch Vince, and they would get together and work with Vince and talk about ideas for TV, put it all on paper, and then go execute. These days, people probably can do you know, group social media chats or group text messages. Back then, was it all by email? Or if somebody had an idea, just strike them in the middle of the night, they wrote it down and then presented it at the round table the next week. We had phones. Okay, but I'm just saying like... Yeah, um, no, a lot of it was on the phone. A lot of it was just writing it down. Yes, we had email, but... Um, that wasn't the I still don't so. use email. <laughs> no, I'm aware. <laughs> as effectively as I guess I should. But... And for, for some of us old-timers, that, that's a hiccup. I, I mean, I still write with pencil. And, cause that's, and some of your old notes are fading now. They are. Because the lead is yes. disappearing. You know? Yes, they are. So let's talk about something that you knew we were going to bring up, the, the plane ride from hell, May fifth, two 2002. I wasn't there. I know you're going to say that. But Sean Waltman says, Michael Hayes was getting real bad. And he's got a lot of heat. Nobody likes him. He was drunk, rowdy as fuck, like being a dick, loud and obnoxious. Hayes almost pissed on Linda McMahon. He was all fucked up, trying to whip his dick out. He didn't know it was Linda. He thinks he's at a fucking bathroom. And he starts saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He just keeps saying, wait a minute, over and over. And the story goes that Bradshaw fucking clocked him and knocked him out. So Hayes is out cold, and he's got that fucking long hair and a ponytail and that mullet. You know, you're still rocking the mullet. And I said, somebody get me a pair of scissors. And I remember Lawler over there just giggling, and everybody's like, no, 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 you're not going to do it. I grabbed those scissors like I was pulling a pair of tape brass knucks out of my tights, really over-exaggerating, and the whole plane just erupted. And uh, Hayes would not realize it was gone until he went through customs. Now, this is all Sean Waltman's account of what happened. What do you remember about the plane ride from hell? And the shenanigans Michael Hayes allegedly was involved in. Well, the, okay, first of all, those are two different plane rides that kind of merged into one because the the alleged urination took place in another plane ride that I was actually a part of. The plane ride from hell is where Michael got his ponytail cut off. And from what I hear, it's kind of that's how it happened. Michael passed out up in the front of the plane, and they kind of had enough, and his ponytail was gone when he discovered, hi, hi, who's the pussy ain't got the ball to face me? And like Jerry Briscoe finally threw his bags up because Michael was challenging everybody on the plane. And Briscoe goes, Michael, you won't fight. We ain't fight. Fuck it. Let's go right now. I don't care. I didn't cut your hair, but shut the fuck up. We can go right now. And then when it was Jerry Briscoe that shut up, that, that said something, I'm like, well, fuck, I I won't fight you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, peeing on Vince, uh, Linda McMahon, pretty famous story. He even alluded to it in his Hall of Fame speech. It led to uh, a saying that became pretty popular with him and some WWE brass, that's on you. Yeah. Well, Michael, Michael had to go to the bathroom. He walked up. Clo he was close to the bathroom. 
and he he started to um, I guess he thought he was in the bathroom. Uh, I came from I saw it from behind. A hunter saw it from the front, but we both saw it thankfully before it was too late and tackled Michael into the actual bathroom. It was one of those doors that kind of went in and both Hunter and I are kind of looking at ourselves going, God, he's not gonna, he's not pissing on us, is he? Because, uh, yeah, free bird was free. Okay, time out. What does it say about how great Michael Hayes is at what he does and how much Vince appreciates him when you consider the stories about him almost pissing on Linda, the airplane ride from hell, Stephanie's wedding, just on and on and on. The guy is a wrestling genius. What other explanation would there be to put up with such crazy behavior? Even one of those stories would get you cut, right? You would think, I mean, think about all the silly stuff that's happened in WWE in the last 30 years that we heard resulted in a firing or a dismissal. Nobody almost pissed on Linda. It just goes to show you that Michael Hayes is a lovable dude. Now we know that because we know him in real life, but we can't convey that enough, but not only is he a likable dude and easy to love, but my God, he must be a wrestling genius for Vince McMahon to do this. We all know how quirky Vince is and for him to sort of turn a blind eye, if you will, or just keep him under his employ. God bless you, Michael Hayes. We love you, but apparently not as much as Vince does. Let's get back to it. Something to wrestle with, uh, Michael Hayes. Uh, Meltzer would continue Sid scoring the clean pin using his power bomb on Bret Hart in the main event was logical, long-term booking, but somewhat gutsy considering the amount of money that the company has invested in Bret Hart and Sid's track record. It's pretty clear that Shawn Michaels should get the title back at Royal rumble. And the Hart is destined for the strap after that, presumably at WrestleMania. This leaves Sid as the obvious challenger for Hart, since he holds a win both over Hart and Michaels. And if anything, builds up more heat for triangle matches for the title, which I suppose would have Michaels going over in. And that would take place on the major shows after the rumble. This leaves Michaels after dropping the strap also in a strong position since theoretically he'll have beaten both Hart and Michaels in those triangle matches leading to the title loss. I'm figuring at some point in there, Austin will get a win over the aforementioned three. So he'll also be positioned in that category for a title feud with Hart later in 97. Of course, we know none of that's going to happen. Sean's going to lose his uh, smile in February and well, plans change. Um, Meltzer would continue saying Hart wasn't able to carry Sid anywhere close to the match. Michaels was, which is something for their own internal bragging rights. The show had satellite transmission problems at various points, which were annoying, but not enough to ruin the show. Both viewers choice and request offered immediate free replay showings to everyone who had ordered. Of course, the replay had the exact same interruptions, but the show drew a legitimate sellout 5,708 fans. There's 4,581 of them paying a gate of $69,000 at the West Palm beach Memorial auditorium. what do you think of that building, Bruce? We don't talk about the West Palm beach building much. Yeah. There's a reason it's the shits. Ain't much to talk about. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was an old building. I like, you know, uh, that was really nice when they got a new building to, to work in. Yeah. It wasn't much to write home about. Sean Michaels cut a pretty spirited promo here saying he had defended the WWF title for eight months while Brett sat and passed judgment from his home in Calgary, but that he's a professional and he's going to sit at ringside and not interfere quote. I'm an emotional wreck and be careful or I might wreck on you Hitman. Yeah. Hitman. uh, Rocky Mavi, as we said, gets a win over South and Sear by DQ six minutes and one second. The interference came from Jim Cornette. Cornette had been managing sincere as uh, revenge against my via who had turned down his managerial advances for a few weeks prior on the superstar show. Motherfucker. Yeah. Cornette was, um, here to see my via use the shoulder breaker finish. And that's when he hit the ring. He being Cornette, my via gets up. And of course, immediately Cornette faints dead in his tracks. The referee sees him calls for the DQ man. Can you imagine if when rock really sort of got his feet underneath him, 
him and Cornette on a microphone back and forth. If he was managing some sort of monster heel that was going to challenge rock, that would have been tremendous. Would it not? In each of their heydays. Yes. Yeah. Uh, before they do the actual pay-per-view, they did another brief angle. Jim Ross is supposed to be interviewing Bret Hart, but in the background, you see Hunter Hearst Helmsley putting the moves on Marlena and Meltzer would say, whose look they've changed to be more feminine and attractive from her hard cigar smoking look. And, uh, in a surprise, we have a, a new wrestling announcer here from AAA, who's going to be taking over the Spanish language broadcast name, Arturo Rivera. <laughs> and, and they get a big plug here on the show. Like when you start the show, they're sure to point them out. And of course we know AAA is going to have a big part in the Royal rumble, but do you remember in this era, you know, not just, are we looking for more Hispanic talent? We're trying to sell more pay-per-views and get more attention in that Mexican market as well. Right? Yeah. We were trying to buy AAA. There you go. Uh, the first I mean, match that, that was, that was the thing. Oh, you must have Arturo Rivera. Um, oh, that's the way they pitched it. You got to have this. Guy. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, yeah. Well, what, you know what? One day we ought to do a, a whole show a, about that. A whole triple triple A experience. At that point, but by the way, triple A was what? Like four years old. I mean, they started in the early nineties, right? Yeah. This was after their heyday. I mean, you know, look when they, when they, when they were in their heyday with, you know, Conan and Eddie and, uh, art and all that shit, you know, they, they were started La park, all those guys, those original, uh, triple a crew that they had, um, their shit was insane. But once you get into it, once you get into their business and, and what have you, and working with them was an absolute nightmare. The match itself here, Brett's working as a heel, even though Sid's the heel. I say that because there's a moment in the match where Brett goes over and undoes the top turnbuckle. Only a bad guy would do that. He's going to try to throw him no, into that. He ex- wouldn't. A smart guy would do that. Well, either way, as you play heel commentator here, Jesse Ventura, they do a spot here where the idea is Sid is going to get pushed into that turnbuckle, but he's going to fall and ultimately Brett's going to hit it, but they stumble and they just repeat the exact same spot again, live on pay-per-view. It stuck out like a sore thumb because you almost never saw this happen in a Bret Hart match. But it happened here with Sid. Uh, we both think the world of Bret Hart is an in-ring performer. Once the bell rang, gosh, he didn't have a lot of equals. But Shawn Michaels, right before this at Survivor Series, had a much better match. Do you think that was uh, something Shawn took great pride in? Because it does feel like these guys were at least competitive with their in-ring performances. Yeah, they were. But but I th- again, I think that uh, there were opponents. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to take this back. I was going to say there were opponents that, that Brett may have a better match than, than Sean, you know, Sean Austin. could work with everybody. And, but at the same time, if you give Brett Hart time, Brett yeah. ain't leaving that ring till he gets them. Yeah. And so Brett had that unique quality that, um, Brett would paint you that picture and, and whether you may not buy it at first, but by God, he would fucking work his ass off until he hooked you at the end and he would own it. Um, and sometimes if he didn't have the time to do that, you didn't get to see it. I think that would frustrate him. Uh, I think that both Sean and Brett, you know, are two of the best I've ever seen ever in the ring. I don't think anybody can argue that. Yeah. Uh, Brett wrote this in his book about the match. Our match turned out to be surprisingly good. Sid had come to respect me because I'd helped him when I could. During our match, Sean sat with Jim Ross at the announcer's table, ranting about his God given right to live his life as he chose. Apparently the remark I'd made a month earlier about him posing for Playgirl had been eating away at him the whole time. Sean got involved in the finish by climbing on the ring apron where we collided allowing Sid to jackknife power bomb me to the mat for the win. I furiously jumped out and pulled Sean's shirt over his head. Like we were in a hockey fight and pretended to beat him senseless. It looked fantastic. 
Sid came back to the dressing room, thrilled with how it went. And Sean seemed nothing but upbeat. But over the next two days of TVs in Florida, he was noticeably distant with me. When I told Vince, I was concerned that I was pissing Sean off. Vince downplayed it. Still, I asked him to clarify things for both being me and Sean. So we could do this thing, right. And he wouldn't listen. Instead of us sorting things out, Sean went out and did an angry in-ring interview with me as the target of his rage. I was disappointed to see him lose his baby face composure. I was thinking, oh, Sean, don't do this. Stay humble. I'm only working. Let me be the heel. I shook my head in utter dismay, trying to figure out what was happening between us. Buddy, just reading that back. We're headed for a collision course and it's December of 96. Absolutely. But again, they had, they had worked out on their own. Hey, let's go, you know, shoot work with this. And man, you know, we don't tell anybody and and we do these personal things and they were both doing what they kind of agreed that they were going to do. And then they both got the, you know, boo boo face and, and butt hurt over the things the other would say and do. So that, that was, you know, the, the reality of the situation. Uh, real quick. I want to recap what happened, uh, after the pay-per-view went off, uh, we would see Brackus defeat Tom Pritchard in a dark match. Uh, and then we would all, oh, that was before, but after the show, uh, finishes the pay-per-view Austin beats gold dust. Michaels beats mankind. Michaels is working more as a baby face here against mankind than maybe he was on the pay-per-view. But when a fan throws a soda at him, he catches it, gives the fan a finger. Sonny's here too, dressed as Santa, handing out some WWF merchandise to fans. Ho, ho, ho. Alrighty. And, uh, that's the end of in your house. It's time. I wanted to talk about the fallout, but Lord, it's way past your bedtime. It's past midnight here. Uh, we should probably wrap this one up. I appreciate you making time given the circumstances of, of what's happened and, and your marathon day. <laughs> Thanks for fitting us in here today, dude. Well, I, I appreciate everyone being patient with us as well. And, uh, it's, as we tried a couple of times this week and just, uh, my schedule became uh, quite erratic and, uh, <laughs> we tried last night. Neither one of us were in any shape by the time that, uh, I reached out to you and I was like, uh, we planned on doing it a little different folks and just couldn't happen. And I said, well, I'll wake up early and do it, but you were already up early doing other things. And, uh, so now here we are and I greatly appreciate the patience and greatly appreciate everyone tuning in, listening to us and by God downloading us. And, uh, for that, I do love y'all and, and I appreciate it. All right. By now you guys know that once upon a time, I uh, hurt my knee in football, never really got it fixed. And well, it's just gotten worse and worse. And some days are better than others, but there's some days where, man, it's just hard to get that rascal going. That's when I found topical CBD, specifically the amazing kind. And I've started using it and I can tell a difference. I really, really recommend you try it out. If you've got a problem with a shoulder or a hip or an elbow, mine's in my knee and I'm telling you it works. The amazing kind is a family run business specializing in plant-based pain relief and wellness support for both mood and sleep. You'll find that their products are of the highest quality and sourced from GMP certified manufacturers. In fact, their products are all tested for quality and purity to make sure that what you're buying is of the highest quality and is exactly what it says it is on the label. Now the amazing kind, they offer a wide range of high quality topicals, infused oils and soft gels including CBD, CBG, and CBN. Now the amazing kind CBD topicals are easy to apply and can be used as needed. That makes them so convenient for on the go relief. And that's what I've started doing. I keep some at the house. I keep some at the office. I highly recommend it. If you've got some localized pain, these topicals can be applied directly to the area. that's giving you some pain or some discomfort. Maybe it's not a joint like me. Maybe you got some sore muscles. Maybe you have a specific skin condition. They can help alleviate pain and inflammation in the target area. These topicals are like creams and lotions and balms and oils, all infused with CBD, but there's so many other benefits, even anti-inflammatory. You see, CBD has been shown as a potential anti-inflammatory agent. And when it's applied topically, it can reduce the inflammation. That'll even help you with really serious things like arthritis or dermatitis or 
maybe just general skin irritation. How about muscle recovery? You've been pushing it too hard and maybe you're sore. Why not use a CBD topical to aid in that muscle recovery? If you're doing a post-workout soreness or maybe you just got some neck tension, I'm telling you, my wife and I were sold on the amazing kind. You can also use it for skin health to help for things like acne and psoriasis and eczema, even dry skin. Some people have even said that it improves their skin texture and reduces some redness. But the chronic pain conditions, that's what I'm talking about. Even things like fibromyalgia and neuropathy, those folks can still find help with a CBD topical on the affected area. I've never been suffering from migraines, but I've got somebody I work with who's really close in my life. And they tell me that CBD topicals even help them with their migraines. So think of the amazing kind for that. It also just helps you relax. Maybe if you're trying to get a massage and you want to just rub this stuff in, why not? The amazing kind is a plant-based topical product for relief from all your aches and pains that are associated with exercise, physical activity, sore muscles, sore joints, inflammation, and arthritis. And you can buy it right now and get 10% off all your orders with the promo code wrestle at the amazing That's the amazing and use our promo code wrestle. You'll save 10% off at the amazing uh, The plan all along was for Shawn Michaels to drop the title at survivor series and then win it back at the Royal rumble in San Antonio, or at least that's the rumor and in innuendo. The result we know is going to be a fantastic match with Sid and Sean. Do you ever think back in hindsight about what if that wouldn't have happened? Do you think the New York audience would have embraced Vader the way they did Sid? No, I don't. I think that, um, because he's a WCW guy or just because of the presentation, because of the presentation, I (laughs) think that part of Look, Sid, man, Sid was Sid. Sid was charismatic as hell and a damn interesting character. So Sid Sid looked that monster part. And I think that by that time in his career, Leon, Leon wasn't what he was before. Right. At this point in his career, it just he just wasn't. He was a little bit less than he, he was Vader light. Well, next up, boy, you got to go out of your way to watch this. Uh, this is the second best match of the show. At least to me, it's the main event and what a New York reaction this is, buddy. Uh, the fans are all about psycho Sid. He's going to come out. Fans are going to start fist bumping him. And remember he's a heel. And, uh, Shawn Michaels is of course the greatest wrestler in the world in this era. Uh, Meltzer would write this, a couple of stories in this match. Michaels did an incredible job carrying Sid to probably the best match in his career. I would agree. He should be given a lot of credit for professionalism because we've seen guys on the night. They're supposed to drop the strap, just really pout and be babies about it. Killing their match. The other story was just about how much the crowd turned on Michaels during the match. It started with light booing early, but as the match went on, the booing was huge. Every time Michaels did any offense. Michaels let it affect him visibly, even if it didn't affect his performance, as he often gave the crowd dirty looks, spit, and swore at ringsiders that were booing him. And the match turned into a very good match with Michaels using flying and speed moves and Sid using power moves. They went back and forth for near falls towards the end, each teasing their big moves, but getting it stopped by the other. Early in the match, a cameraman got in Sid's way, which was a spot that would build up the finish. At the end, Sid got the camera and nailed Jose Lothario with it. Lothario took a delayed bump and began clutching his chest, and the announcers acted as if Lothario was suffering a heart attack. Michaels hit the super kick, but instead of going to pin Sid, jumped out of the ring to help Jose. Sid finally got up and hit Michaels with the camera as he hovered over Lothario, threw him in the ring, and pinned him after a powerbomb. Michaels crawled out of the ring and began hovering over Jose, with Michael selling the idea that what was happening with Lothario was a lot more important than losing the title three and a quarter stars. I mean, listen, sometimes we say, oh, we hate heart attack angles and the silliness and all that. But the sweet story that we have known for all of 96 is that Jose Lothario is this almost Mickey type character in the vein of Rocky for Shawn Michaels. 
And now here he is, this older gentleman attacked by this hulking giant. And he's more concerned about his, his friend than the title. And ultimately it costs him the title. And these rabid New York fans, a lot of them, including Vladimir, who's sitting ringside is all about it. They think of Sid as the man and Sid has no problem reminding you he's the man, just a great match. And I agree with Dave, probably the best of Sid's career. What say you, Bruce? Great story. That was an absolutely tremendous story. It was a great story that Sid played perfectly. And Sean, man, was there for everything and made it. And even if you didn't care, which a lot of people didn't care about Jose is passionately as they cared about Sean and, and everyone else. Uh, you cared about Jose then because Sean cared and that's what made it. It's even if you didn't give a shit about Jose, you cared because Sean cared and was willing to, to make that sacrifice for him. Chat me up about the reaction. Were, were you surprised? Was Vince surprised by the reaction to Sid or Sean during this match? Not really. No, because because Sid was getting those reactions. Sid, you know, was going out and big, impressive bastard, and people were cheering him everywhere we went. So you kind of thought that was going to happen, but we also thought that for him to, you know, do something to Jose and and then capitalize on that, that that would turn him. And I I think it did. I really think that that people did turn on Sid after the fact. It's so historically significant, uh, but, and it's just, it's so well done. Go out of your way to watch those two matches. I think Brett and Austin and Sid and Sean, man, it's just about as good as it got in 1996, at least for me. And it's the first time I remember seeing a New York crowd show like a heel edge, you know, that, I mean, it feels like before this, they were just cheering the baby faces and here we, we got to see maybe. Uh, we're going to regurgitate some of this white meat baby face stuff. We like the badasses. I think this is a, a, a damn near perfect pay-per-view. Don't get me wrong. There are spots throughout it that don't age well, but just my fandom, the nostalgia of it, watching it back 25 years later. Uh, and instead of just skipping around, like I had to this week, I'm going to sit down and rewatch the whole thing tonight. I, I love the show. What say you, Bruce? I love the show too. It was good to go back because you, you think of, you know, the Montreal screw job is a, is which that was as well. It was a hell of a card as well. This is kind of like the forgotten one. Yeah. That, that just goes by the wayside that, you know, Oh yeah, no. What, what did we do then? Um, I thought it was tremendous. Really, really good shit. I want to mention too, we're, we got some fan questions and we'll wrap this one up. We're going to get out of here, but before I do. The reaction after the Brett and Austin match, we go back to the desk and you see Jr. doing some, some heavy lifting and Jr. was at his best here. I thought he did a fantastic job in that match in particular. Um, but he's just hammering home the fact that there was no ring rust with Brett. Uh, you know, Austin had Brett at his best, blah, blah, blah. And you could see Vince was like, I totally disagree. Were they off? I mean, how challenging was that from a storytelling standpoint, when you have the quote unquote boss on commentary and Jr. is there trying to sell one way, Hey, he beat him at his best. There was no ring rust. He looked as good as ever. And then you could tell that's not the direction Vince wanted to go. What do you make of that? It's called the work Connie. So that was planned ahead of time, right? I I'm going to say he had ring rust. You're going to say he didn't. Was that the same? Well, it's not necessarily planned, but it's, it's just taking a different point of view. It's just interesting that in theory, Jr. supposed to be fresh off of being the heel and, and Vince is the baby face. So you would think Vince being the baby face commentator, the lead voice, if you will. And since Brett, I mean, you gotta get excited. I've been saving people all those dollars. They can live in Z ride and jet fly now with that extra cash. And they can style and profile with a quick 10 minute phone call right now to 425-0105. That's 425-0105. Woo! Save with Conrad.com. It's the baby face. You would think he would be the one beating the drum of, hey, Brett had no ring rust. He was great. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. 
Uh, let's do some questions here. Lenny Bakken wants to know any idea how the relationship was at the time here in uh, November of 96 between Janetti and Sean. Their relationship was, you know, it was friendly. It was good. They weren't hanging out buddies or anything like that, but they were, they were friendly. It was business. JD Shea wants to know, where did you guys get the shark cage? Sharks are us. Oh, I thought it was shark cage see, sharks. Us. No man. Cause Conrad, now you're being silly. Uh, my apologies. I guess they sharks are to... us has everything sharp. All your shark accessories, all your shark accessories. I see. You need shark cage. You need shark wire. You need shark hook. Go to sharks are us. Right. It's not like shark hooks are us. Yeah. Sharks are us. Got it. Or sharks be us and shit. Oh, that's like the rival store, the spite store across the street, right? Ding, ding, ding. I heard about that. You got to have the end shit in there too. Yeah. They even put it that way in the phone book. Yes. Uh, Owen wants to know. That's when you look it up and it's, it's triple a, we be sharks and shit. Mm. A, 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 so that it's first comes up in the phone book. Uh, tune in next week for more early nineties phone book hacks. Uh, <laughs> Owen wants to know, was that real? I, I do too. Why do you think we're one ST family mortgage? There you go. Uh, was that really, um, ultimate warriors old pyro set up for the Sid entrance pyro? Of course it was that little stick, but I like the S right. The suddenly I'm dominant as Jr. said here, S I D in sparklers, as opposed to, uh, the old ultimate warrior logo. Boy, these were different days. I bet that pyro budget was a lot different in November of 96 than it was a few years later. A little bit. Uh, Drew Landry wants to know, it seems the aisle to the ring was shorter than at WrestleMania. Was this due to the setup or has MSG always been closer than expected? Well, for this particular show it was, it was the traditional setup. So it was a lot, lot shorter than what, then later on we started going on the, uh, the far ends. Uh, Bob says, uh, Hey Bruce, hypothetically, if Austin and Hart match didn't work or get the reception, it did. Would Austin have still received his push. Did this match determine that, or was it inevitable? That is interesting to think about Bruce. What if the match wasn't great? What if it was a miss, you know, in a different time and place, we used to hear that maybe the one, two, three kid or Sean Waltman, as we know him was the measuring stick. And he would come to the back and say, Oh, he ain't got it. At this point, if Brett would have came back and the match would have been a stinker, and thankfully it wasn't, but if it would have been, would that have cut Austin's water off as they like to say? I don't think it necessarily would have. It might have shortened the program up a little bit, but I don't think that it would have been, oh my God, Steve doesn't have it. Uh, Cause Steve definitely had it. Do you have any idea what that orange finger is? I don't see it Anything at all. Oh, right is, behind, right in I between them. I see it now. Not macho, man. What is that? No, I don't know. I mean, it's sticking up there. Is it? No, I don't know. Fuck it. Who who else were the top draws here? Um, JYD, Hulk, um, Steamboat. Let's look, WWF 19. I bet some of our listeners are tweeting us right now as they're hearing this angry. How could you not know? She's probably who just, the fuck the orange finger is. She probably just text, uh, text Zach Ryder. He probably fucking knows. I mean, I know they had an orange macho madness finger, but that ain't it. Dude, you know what it is? What? It's an orange finger for the fucking security in Chicago. Well, I thought that at first, but I thought you would laugh. Why would I laugh at the right answer? You know, it's a Chicago land, uh, bagpipe troop. Whatever. Maybe it's that's Roddy. what it says right there. Chicago land bagpipe troop. It's gotta be, uh, Roddy Piper. Yeah. Hot rod right there. You don't always want to that kilt. How many of them did he have? By the way, how about Hogan here in the white dude? Yeah, I always liked the white and I always liked the turquoise. Because I thought he popped in the turquoise. I always liked the turquoise. Well, let me tell you something, brother. And, and you also get the bandana kind of off to the side a little bit, kind of drooping down the eye. You know, there were different different little hoax things. And then, it, you know, the more hair he lost, the more they wanted to cover all that up. 
Here he still had some on top. Granted, not a lot, but he had some. So shit's getting old. <laughs> what? I don't know. Just. And I like that championship belt he's got on there too. The Hogan eighty six man. But it's eighty five. Yeah. Why are they call it the Hogan eighty six? Well, because he had a different style. Um, in eighty five, he had two belts that looked very very similar. That one was an eighty four, one was an eighty five. The shape is almost identical, but there are some differences. And then they went to this one, and this is the one he wore. Uh, this is the Hogan 86, and then they did a, a similar one for Hogan 87. Uh, a, a minor difference, not a big difference. And that's the one he wore with Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3. And then, of course, in 88 is when we would see the debut of the really famous quote unquote winged eagle, which is my favorite belt ever. Well, I personally like the one that they had in April of 1944 with the time and it had a dog on it. I don't know. I played for Mercy, and I'm pretty sure that the elephant design that I had submitted was probably liked by everybody, except there was one person that didn't particularly care for it. They liked eagles instead of elephants. Okay. I'm just saying. Is Clint still hanging out? Yeah, Clint's still around. He was at StarCast. All right. I'm taking Clint to get his first pedicure this Friday. Oh, good call. I was told that, uh, it looked as if, uh, it was going to take three or four to get all the dead skin off. Ooh. Wow. I'm going to take some before and after pictures from even put it on Patreon. I like it. You going to do uh, a Manny too? Oh no, I've never had a Manny here. It's not for me. Oh, you gotta do both. No, you gotta Manny petty. No, it's about getting the dead skin off your feet so that you're, so you're not, uh, snagging your sheets and whatever well yeah but you also want your hands to look presentable as well you're just gonna keep talking over this this world title match here Hulk well Hogan, brother uh, give me the belt back dude oh. I say, this is a championship fight right here by god and this is ronnie piper at his best man he never stops going i love piper in this era you know coming out with the uh the bagpipes and the kilt and the all blue and just getting after it, man. Everything he did looked like a fight. There was very little wrestling, just brawl, brawl, brawl. It's good stuff. Yes. And he rarely sold for shit. <laughs> yeah. Roddy wasn't going to sell a whole lot either. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know what, man, you're going to kind of throw some lame ass shit, man. I'm going to give you a lame ass sell there. Okay. Poke me in the eyes. I poke you in the eyes. Here we go there. Baba. Okay. Yeah. Just go ahead and take that. I'm the heel. You're the guy that sells. It's what we do. By the way, I think, uh, I think those boots that Piper's wearing, if I'm not mistaken, uh, were just purchased by doo trucking.com's own, uh, Jeff Jewett. You know who made those boots? Clifford Macias. Yes, he did. Probably Roddy, you know, not saying Roddy was cheap, but Roddy was cheap. So you asked earlier about his kilt. That kilt he wore forever. Where did it wind and up? It w- Same one, dude. Well, where did it and wind he- up? Where is it now? Do you know? I would hope that Kitty's got it. She sold a bunch of stuff recently. I, yeah, maybe she, I, I just don't know if, um, uh, it's kind of like the jacket, man. Uh, Rhonda got the jacket, but I don't know where that kilt went. I tried for years to get the kilt that one. And Roddy, you say, yeah, when I hang up the kilt, man, you know, I don't know, but, uh, he had, he had different ones through the years that he would wear from time to time. But that one, it was the one he wore the most. Chat me up. What's your most prized wrestling possession? Uh, probably Maurice. Give the full story for some of our listeners. The death mask of Maurice Tillet, the French angel that was, uh, Paul Bosch had, had his death mask bronzed. And there are only a couple of them that exist in the world. And none of them, I have the only bronzed one, but there's, uh, a, uh, plaster or a wax 
one in York Museum, and then there's a gentleman, I believe, in Milwaukee or Minneapolis, somewhere uh, up there that has a wax of Maurice Tillet's uh, death mask. And that, that's probably the neatest thing that I have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really into that that much, but I would have loved to have had Piper's kill. That would, cause that would have meant something to me. I have my undisputed something to wrestle with, uh, Bruce Pritchard podcast of the year championship belt hanging right above my head and the United States or the U S championship belt that Fritz von Erich had back in the day. But that's about it. And I got Paul Bosch's 50 year anniversary trophy, the big seven footer. But other than that, yeah, I don't know. Lots of pictures, but not, I don't have a lot of that shit. Not like you, you got, you got the cool shit. I don't have that cool shit. I have some cool stuff, but we know some collectors who have a lot cooler. Yeah, exactly. But you know, like, is it the fourth floor or the fifth floor where you've got like the whole one room? There is, there are no fourth or fifth floors. You're just making shit up. I am not. Do you, or do you not have an elevator in your home? There's no fourth or fifth floor. I have a two story home with a basement. Okay. So we've established three stories so far <laughs> in a, in an infinity pool. I have two car garage. You're acting like I got this palatial estate. I got a two car garage. How many cars can you fit in your cul-de-sac? I don't know. Never tried. Have to. I've been, I've been there for the parties. Well, the one. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, exactly. Uh oh, what's that referee's name again? Bonesaw Jones. No, his shirt got ripped. It's Crypt Keeper Jones. I like Bonesaw better. Bonesaw was uh, Macho Man's nickname in the Spider-Man movie. I know he took it from uh, Bonesaw here. That was all his. <laughs> that was all his favorite referees. Well, one to be memorialized in Spider-Man. Yeah. That's why he did the job for Spidey. She loved the shot only of Hogan's finger, and then it goes out of the shot there a little bit. And Piper, God bless him. This is one of the worst damn uh, sleeper holds I've ever seen in my life. Why? It's not how you put a sleeper on. Well, I'll tell you who knows how to put a sleeper on. Well, no, I can't say. Never mind. Vern Gagne? Sure. Yeah. Vern Gagne. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. There you go. Or Mr. Wrestling number two. <laughs> him too. He, he wore a mask, right? Yeah, him too. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure of his real identity. Yeah. Steve Taylor taking pictures at ringside, by God. Oh, that's him in the corner? Yep. One of my favorite pictures that I have in my office is a picture from the Poconos of me in a heart shaped tub and my brother loves shit and Steve laying down shooting up into the mirror. So it gave you one of those infinity effects. Right. And so it's Steve taking a picture of me in the mirror and it's just a great shot. Cause it's just me and Steve kind of laying, he's laying outside the tub. I'm in the tub, but it's, it goes on forever. It's a pretty cool shot. Oh my God. Bone saws down. Oh, no. Come on. Ah, oh, come on, Roddy. What are you doing with the chair? Ah, oh, to the back. The holster. That's going to leave a mark. That's a I don't yellow know why I went chair, into Lance too. Russell. But... You're in the Lance Russell because it's now one of your low key best impressions. <laughs> well, if Hogan only had that damn shit and he had it in his trunks at Halloween Havoc. He could burn the mat right now and create a small fire that would then burn Roddy Piper and cause him to... Uh-oh. The, oh, the second worst sleeper hold on ever. No, oh, my God. It's the worst one ever. Oh, my God. Vern Gagne probably taught him that. Uh, Bonesaw, ring that bell. That's interference right there. I'm pretty sure that the choke that the sleeper had turned into a choke. 
two matches yeah. remain, ladies and gentlemen, two matches remain a semifinal tournament match with Randy Savage and the dynamite kid. Of course, your main event junkyard dog against someone else. And, uh, of course the winner of dynamite kid, Randy Savage, and somewhere in here, we're going to give away a Rolls Royce. So you've got to look forward to in the next 40 minutes here. So we're home stretching it here on wrestling classic from 1985. I'm trying to pick out the cameraman, see if it's any of our, uh, old Unitel camera guys that we used to use. It may be Chris DeFury down there. I don't know. No, he's too big to be DeFury. Hulk Hogan now. There, there's old bone saw. Raise that hand. Being saved by Paul Lorner. Why is this guy flipping us off with the Hulkamania shit? He's an asshole. So, dude, flipping us off at the 85 class, Conrad says you're an asshole, and I agree. By the way, I feel like we should mention the number one song in America, according to the Billboard charts. Do you want to guess what it was? Uh, the Tiger. The Miami Vice theme. Oh, shit. I uh, The Tiger, I guess, was a few years before that, wasn't it? Number two was part-time lover by stevie wonder number three was tears for fears head over heels number four was glenn phrase you belong to the city number five is starships we built this city number eight a lot of techno rock in those days huh number eight was take on me by aha take on me take on me take me Is that, is that right? No, I think you combined several songs there. Well, it's all right. I ain't got a fever, got a permanent disease, and then it's JYD that's gonna talk to me, Gene, right now. Well, the new hip thing I want to tell you about is an amazing new app called Vita. They've created a new form of advertising that eliminates spam and allows everyone to get paid for their time and attention. You simply go to Vita.io to download the Vita app and select a free second phone number. So you no longer have to worry about giving away your personal number. When a telemarketer calls your Vita number, they'll need to pay to get their message through. And the best part is the app is completely free. Brands are finally realizing the value of rewarding their customers for their time and attention. And our new sponsor crowd health is using it. But it's not only a fun way to support the show, but you can also earn some money in the process. So please try it out today by downloading the app at vida.io or by calling 509 wrestle and following the link. That's 509-973-7853 and help support the show. Call now and you'll earn your first dollar just for downloading. That's vida.io or call 509 wrestle. That's 509 wrestle and you'll earn your first dollar for just downloading. Um, January 96 gorilla monsoon goes down. Of course, when big van Vader, uh, attacks him and, and of course, gorilla is the on-screen commissioner. So he's replaced by rowdy, Roddy Piper. And the rumored innuendo is that the original plan for WrestleMania 12 was razor Ramon versus gold dust. And that's certainly the direction we were starting in early 96, but allegedly Scott Hall is uncomfortable with this. So the decision is made to pivot to Piper. Why was Piper the guy to do it? And were there any other ideas that were considered instead of Piper? Well, along the way to the promotion of WrestleMania 12, Goldust character was getting hot. Razor was considered. Razor didn't want to do it. So we were looking for someone else for Goldust. Also along the way, considered for WrestleMania 12, was it's in LA or it's in Anaheim. Hollywood, California. What kind of a Hollywood tie-in can we do? O.J. Simpson had recently been acquitted uh, in the O.J. Simpson trial. O.J. Simpson was red hot. I think that you could find a lot of people that wanted to see O.J. get his ass kicked. And that was a real common thread amongst pretty much everyone. 
So the question was asked, what if O.J. Simpson got in the ring and put him against, you know, somebody and O.J. gets his ass kicked? And thinking about different people, Piper's name came up. And Piper was interested in it. Um, O.J.'s people were at least listen to it, but then, you know, when we got outside of the bubble and we got outside of um, a handful of people even knowing this idea existed, the backlash and the, the horrible feedback came in so quickly that we quickly realized that, yeah, this is not going to work. There's no way, absolutely no way to spin this. There's no way to make this palatable for anyone I don't care who you are, um, to make this match a reality. So now, me ain't. Left turn. Goldust needs an opponent. We're back to Hollywood. We were using Roddy for Hollywood. Wait, hang Goldust. on, hang on, hang on. Let's talk about the OJ thing for a minute here. Um, this is, because I know a lot of people hear that idea and probably attribute it to Vince Russo. This is pre-Russo, right? Pre-Russo. Well, what's great to me is, you know, we always hear all these crazy ideas that were blamed on Vince Russo and people say, oh no, he needed Vince McMahon as like a governor, you know, to sort of oversee the decisions. But Vince McMahon was on board with this OJ idea. How does he present it? I mean, what did he think well, about it? Well, I think it might have kind of originally came out of my mouth. I don't really know. But Vince tried it on. I mean, we, we got it to the point of at least throwing it out there. But he thank tried God, it on and it cooler didn't heads, cooler head, yeah, cooler heads prevailed and and we didn't go down that road. Look, so, not all my ideas are great ideas, okay? I invented the million dollar man, I created the million dollar belt. Um I created this podcast, I invented the headlock. Um sometimes I'm going to have a bad idea, Conrad. This okay. was it. This is the one. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll give you the one for the rest of this season. This is this so is, this is my bad idea. Uh, yeah, this and wanting to have a public execution on pay per view. Other than that, that's it for bad ideas ever. But in neither of these situations, whether it's with Hogan or Mister T or whoever, does he do a clean pinfall? And that's something that Piper really made his calling card on, and he's on record as saying. Quote, I got kids. The way I feed my children is how much money I can make. I wouldn't lay my shoulders down for anybody, end quote. And uh, Dave Meltzer once wrote after Roddy passed away in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Piper said what everyone else knew but wouldn't say, which was the W track record was that heels would get hot and have a big money drawing run, lose to the champion, and then mostly work mid cards. He felt that as long as he never lost to the champion, he would have enough steam to continue to be a main eventer. In fact, during his first run with the company, through his first announced retirement angle in 1987, Piper only lost one match by pinfall, a Fijian death match to Snuka on July 20th, 1984 at Keel Auditorium in St. Louis in their third singles meeting in the city. This is a, a different era, a different time. But that was like Piper's calling card for a long time. He would absolutely not lose to Hogan or anybody else. Did you ever have a conversation with Piper about that? Roddy was very old school. And Roddy was of the opinion that if you, if you lose, that hurts you. I've never been of that opinion. And we actually used to get in arguments over it all the time. Because I, I just don't buy that philosophy. I don't think that uh, a loss hurts you as long as you maintain your heat. And you keep doing what you do well and do it better than anybody else. Uh, Roddy disagreed with that. And he did maintain that if he was to lose, that would hurt him. And, you know, it was no secret that the old system in the old New York territory, if you were, it was a heel factory. They had a babyface champion. Heels came in. They worked on top with the champion, and then they went around after the fact, and they worked with the, the next guy in line, and then they were gone, and they, they went away to come back at a later date. Now with national expansion, and now there's no place else to go, really. Yes, they could leave and go to Jim Crockett, 
But Vince was not looking for people to leave. He wanted to create stars. So I think that he gave in. You know, I'm sure that he fed into, okay, Roddy. Um, and obviously Vince fed into it and Vince accepted it because Roddy didn't do a lot of jobs. And he felt that that kept Roddy Piper special. And he agreed with it. So it worked. All time ever on camera. Well, that and the fact that Bobby is wearing a members only jacket. He's the last member. Is he? Yeah. I, you know what? I don't even know if that's a real members only jacket. That may have been a ripoff. How do you, I mean, who ripped off a members only jacket? They certainly made it look like it. Wait a minute. That's not even a real Rolex he's wearing. Yeah, that, that is real Rolex. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. That's some bullshit. No, that's real Rolex. He's got his BH little, little pinky finger thing. And, but the members only jacket is not a real members only like jacket. King, I don't think it is. Is that like a bullshit King Midas Rolex? Cause that is not, uh, a day date or a date just. Well, it's a Rolex. No, it's not. Yes, how, it is. How about that gold chain he's wearing? He's almost wearing it like a choker. Well, that's got his, his name in Hebrew. By the way. Do you know what it means in 2019? If a girl wears a choker necklace like that, what does it mean? It means fucking roll tide, son. One like Bobby's got no, just, you know, how a few years ago that was like the thing Well, there's still some girls hanging on to that and they're nice girls. And how, how, how would you know this? Okay. They were, so they were three years ago when I was single. I don't know what they're doing in 2019. But you said 2019 specifically. Well, you have I, a friend that has told you this because <laughs> if that friend is Dave Silva, let me let me tell you from personal experience, his information is probably dead ass fucking wrong. Well, wait a minute. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that Dave lies and doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about most of the time. Maybe it's just a thing with people named Dave. Okay. I didn't know Dave Silva was a liar. You're saying Dave Silva is a liar. I'm saying Dave Silva is full of shit. Well, I know for sure that's not true because he blew up the production bathroom. We had two people in Baltimore take shits that were so incredibly offensive that it cleared out the entire production office. Why would you allow him to do that? I wasn't in there. But one, but, I, 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 but one of them was Dave Silva. Do you want to guess who the other one was? Matt Coon? No, he's been a guest on one of our shows, maybe more than one. And, uh, someone else who was a guest on our show once told the story that this person's flashlights was so bad. They had to sell the car. He farted in. I don't know the blue mini. Oh God. Yeah. Well, could also, you imagine when those gates of hell separated and whatever was stuck inside of there was allowed to escape. Al snow told the story that, uh, when he was training Manny, that Manny would, uh, would ride with him. And he would, you know, hit towns with him and he would rip ass and do his cloth seats of this automobile. And he says that it was so horrific, the gas smells that he had to sell the car and no one would even buy the car. Cause when they come check it out, there was just overwhelming doo-doo smells that he could not Febreze away. And that was before Febreze. Yeah. So this is, uh, there you go. The blue guy. Would make you blue in the face trying to hold your breath because of his 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 crazy levels of doo-doo smells. So you allowed the blue meanie and Dave Silva both to use your facilities, and they both just destroyed your production area. Well, you know, I'm a sucker for that. I don't know if you remember, but Jeff Jewett here from doodoo years ago took a shit so absurd upstairs in my house. They just fucked up the plumbing for the whole house. Like I had to hire multiple plumbers to come out and undo what he did. It's always good when you have a house guest who comes and says, um, I'm sorry to bother you. Do you have a plunger? <laughs> yeah. Bobby Heenan. When I went through, uh, to look at a condo many, many years ago, Bobby came with me and he asked the guys who walked in he says, yeah, yeah. Hey, you, you got a bathroom I can, I can just use real quick. And Bobby disappeared into the bathroom and it's, the place is empty. It's not that big of a place. And all you hear is, uh, oh, <laughs> Bobby came out and that was the first thing he asked. He said, um, do you have a plunger? 
And the guy looked at me and looked at me and goes, uh, no, I, I don't. He says, Bruce, we should probably go. I don't, I don't think this place is going to work for you. And he didn't really do anything, but it was a good rib. But Jewett messing up your house. That's nice. Yeah. And I'm going to live here for a long time, as you know, and my, my plumbing may never be the same. I never, I never did that at your house. No, you always went downstairs and you would just send it right into the foundation. Exactly. You that way I could get my butt washed. You had a routine. I did. I would go downstairs. I, I would, I would get up. I would walk out of my suite and I would go right into the elevator and I would take the elevator all the way down to the, to the last floor, way down at the bottom. <laughs> and <laughs> And I would get out and I would make the trek to the, to the doo-doo haven. And I would, I would go poopies and, and it had a nice little bidet and I would get my hiney washed. And then I would walk in to the tanning thing and I would tan. And then I would go from the tanning booth into the gym and I would ride my bike for 45 minutes. And then I would go upstairs and bathe. And you would clean the sweat and the doo-doo. The doo-doo was clean from the ass washer in the toilet in the uh, bottom floor across from the flare suite. Well, <laughs> what? It's down the hall from the flare suite. It was suite. in a whole, yeah, it was down the hall, but that was in a whole different wing of the house. Why do you make my house sound gargantuan? Why are you doing because that? Because it is fucking gargantuan. My house is smaller than your new house. Not even close. Yeah, my, uh, my, my house could fit in your lower level what, and you'd still have room. Are you talking about my colon? Your lower level down there. What is that? The third or the fourth floor? You know what? I always forget because I'm... you got all those, you, the, the one elevator goes down <laughs> to all of them. <laughs> How many bars do you have in your house? I don't know. What type of question is that? Well, okay. Let me just say, how many bars do you have in your house? I don't know. Well, all right. Well, let me see. One, one two, three, two, four, three, five, four, six. Five, just six. Okay, six. That's five more than I have in mine. How much snow do you get at your house? I bet you're going to beat me there. I bet you I haven't yet. But I bet you that I got more fucking leaves falling than, uh, uh-oh, Bob Orton went right on his pee-pee. Why, why didn't that match stop? Well, because he can continue. See, you may not know this, but Bob Orton had his pee-pee in a cast. Oh, makes sense. Yeah. He didn't have, he didn't need blue chew. He had a permanently hard dick. When things are explained logically, it logically makes sense. By the way, do you think, uh, just looking at Paul... Conrad Thompson, and there's one thing we can all agree on health insurance sucks. It's confusing, expensive, and frustrating. Well, for the last several weeks, we've been telling you that there's a better way. Welcome to the alternative that is Crowd Health, created to get rid of the headaches of health insurance. Here to tell us more about Crowd Health is the founder, Andy. Andy, what's going on, man? How are you? Thanks for jumping on. Hey, thanks for having me. Doing great. Can't complain. Man, in reading your story, I can see why you looked for an alternative. For our listeners that don't know, tell us why you started an alternative to health insurance. Yeah, it was it was right around this time of year, several years back, where I was coming off of my old company and so didn't have health insurance. Uh, most of us get health insurance through our companies. And so I went to Obamacare, healthcare.gov, um, and got a plan. It was 1200 bucks for me, my wife, and my two girls. And I kind of joke, it worked until I had to use it. Uh, my little one, who's one at the time, was having recurring ear infections. And so we went to the ear, nose, and throat doctor who said, she's got a hole in her eardrum. You have to get surgery. So head off, got surgery, 15 minute procedure, got the bill, $8,000 for 15 minute procedure. Wow. And little did I know the insurance company a few weeks later was gonna send me a note saying that they wouldn't pay for it. It was medically unnecessary, they wouldn't pay for it. 
So it was at that point where I was like, man, this health insurance does suck. We have to come up with an alternative. Um, you know, I've, I've been super fortunate. I can write an $8,000 check, but most people in the United States can't write an $8,000 check and it's putting people into bankruptcy. So we've got to figure out a, a different way to do healthcare that keeps people from, from going into bankruptcy, is easier to use, allows them to get better care. And so that's why I joined, or I started Crowd Health. I've actually read where over a quarter million people, over 250,000 families with insurance still wind up declaring bankruptcy due to medical bills. Can that be right? Yeah. I mean, that's it, that's the crazy thing about our system is you can have health insurance and have a medical event and still go bankrupt. So for my example, um, a pretty benign thing happened. This happens to lots of kids all over the place, holes in the eardrum because of recurring ear infections. And it was $8,000. So, you know, if you don't have $8,000 in the bank, that's going to put you into bankruptcy. Um, the other thing I found out is with some of these Obamacare plans is uh, in 2021, it's the last data that we had, 48 million claims were denied. So, mm. you know, I was, you know, one of those people. One of my claims were denied. And it's fine if, you know, $100 office visits denied. But what happens when a eight thousand or fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollar claim gets denied you know that puts people in really financial you know difficulties so what we've done with crowd health is said hey you pay the first 500 bucks of a health event we have a community that will help you out with the rest and so if you go to the er if you have a surgery if you have a you know any of any big health event that you can think of cancer it's 500 bucks anybody should be able to come up with 500 bucks um and so you know over the last three years with 6,000 people as a part of Crowd Health, nobody's had medical debt, nobody's gone into bankruptcy as a result of, of healthcare. And so that's something we're super proud of. Hey, something I wanted to ask you, I know one of the things that everybody hates about traditional insurance is having to choose a doctor from a certain network. With Crowd Health, can you only still see certain doctors or how does that work with Crowd Health? When I was starting the company, it's the first thing my wife asked me because she'd be the only, always the one that would ask me, is my OBGYN in, you know, in network or out of network? Yeah, that's a great thing. It's You can go anywhere you want. Um, you know, we, we don't limit where you can you can go. So if you have a favorite doc or pediatrician or whatever, um, there's no networks to worry about. All we ask that you do is go and say, hey, can you give me the cash pay rate? And typically that cash pay rate, funny enough, is 30 or 40% less than what they get from a big health insurance plan. Um, and so that's what makes this model work is we're just getting way better rates for our members than even health insurance plans. The Vegas companies in the planet get for their members. Um, so that's the, the, the beauty of this system. Well, Andy, you've told us how it works when you go to the doctor, but what about prescriptions? How do prescriptions work with Crowd Health? Yeah, here's the great thing, right? So if you have a health event, like I said before is you're, um, you, you commit to paying the first 500 bucks and then anything after that, then we submit to the community. So whether that's a follow-up visit, whether it's imaging, so let's just say you have cancer um, and there's going to be many doctor visits, many imaging visits, many prescriptions, all of those things are included in that health event. So you'll pay the first $500 of that health event and then we'll submit the rest to the community. And so those prescriptions and everything is included in that. And we've done, you know, everything from a $49 pediatrician visit to a several hundred thousand dollar, you know, brain hemorrhage. Um, we've got five or six cancer cases going on right now. Um, we've had, I think, 150 babies. So, you know, it's, it's not only for these little events, but these big events too, which include, you know, some of these prescription drugs that are really, really expensive. Let's talk about the cost. I see where it's simply 175 for an individual or just 575 for a family or four or more. Mm -hmm. What do you get for those fees, Andy? Yeah, I mean, you only, so any of the big events, you get the 500, you know, it's 500 bucks and then you have a community. What you get is a community behind you who will help you with these, with any of those big events. But the other cool thing that you get is you have a care advocate at Crowd Health. One of the things I hate about health insurance is when I call in, I'm talking to a call center in India somewhere that I'm telling them about my health event and then they don't know what to do. So they punt me to somebody else. What well, Crowd Health, you have a person internally that you can call anytime you want to 
Um, they're going to help you through in whatever health event that you have. Um, they'll provide you access to also online virtual urgent care. So if you have an urgent care thing pop up, my daughter fell off of her bed a few months back. We called a virtual urgent care. They were able to take it, take care of it as opposed to us having to go to the hospital to take care of it. You get unlimited virtual primary care. So you can go on your app and there's a primary care doctor that you can talk to pretty much any time of the day. Um, you have um, a talk therapy, so unlimited talk therapy. So if you wanted to have some counseling with an online counselor, you can have unlimited online counseling. So all of these things are incorporated and more into you know the crowd health uh, service. Well, our listeners already know this, but I want to take a minute here to remind them because you listen to our show, you can get started with crowd health today for just $99 per month, for the first three months. When you use our code wrestle to get the health care you deserve, learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. Andy, thank you so much for coming on and telling us more about crowd health today. Thanks brother. Have, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. And happy holidays. Be sure to check us out at joincrowdhealth.com. Use that promo code wrestle and you'll get crowd health started for $99 a month for the first three months at joincrowdhealth.com with the promo code WRESTLE.